All right. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Um, would everyone please take their me. seats? We'd like to get started. Good morning. I feel like this doesn't work. Can you hear me? Can you tell them what we're starting? Good morning. Okay. If everyone could please take their seats. Yeah, I just, can you hear me? I don't think- Hello, can... no. hello, no. hello. The microphone is not working. You're really close to this lock on my head. Hello? Oh, I just started not working. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. No, people can't hear me. No, I don't think so. Good morning. The May 26th Board of Directors meeting is now called to order. First, I would like to ask uh, Grisel to explain how to access interpretation. Hello, good morning. Thank you. I will repeat the following message in English. Este es un aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla en Zoom, en donde aparecen los controles. Haga, aquí, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo y seleccione Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación del Zoom del celular o tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos y luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. Si se ha unido a la reunión de hoy en la sala de juntas de Sandag y necesita interpretación al español, por favor diríjase a la recepción del piso 7 y solicite un receptor. El receptor se aparece a un pequeño iPod y se puede usar para escuchar la reunión en español. Simplemente sostenga el auricular junto a su oído y la interpretación comenzará automáticamente. To use the Zoom interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon that appears as a globe and select either English or Spanish. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app, please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. If you're joining us today at Sandeg and need interpretation into Spanish, please check out a headset from the receptionist on the seventh floor. The headset looks like a little iPod and comes with an earpiece, which you can use to hear the meeting in Spanish. Simply hold the earpiece to your ear and the interpreter will come on automatically. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and start the meeting with a tribal acknowledgement. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the land um, that we call home. The tribal nations of the San Diego region have historically faced injustices. We acknowledge the harmony that existed between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systemic oppression. We pay our respects to the unceded territory and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States, from our cultural groups, the Cumia, the Iño, the Luiseño, the Cupeño, and the Cahuilla. The sun has nurtured, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandek community, we acknowledge this legacy. We aspire to learn from indigenous traditional knowledge and experiences in undoing the injustices of the past. With that, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tessa, could you please take roll? Good morning. For the city of Carlsbad, Council Member Burkholder. Burkholder present. For the city of Chula Vista, Council Member Cardenas. Cardenas present. For the city of Coronado, Council Member Duncan. Duncan present for Coronado. For the county of San Diego, Chairwoman Vargas. Vargas present. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Anderson. Here. For the city of Del Mar, Council Member Gasterland. Present. City of El Cajon, Mayor Wells. Here. City of Encinitas, Mayor Kranz. Here. City of Escondido, Mayor White. Present. City of Imperial Beach, Council Member Fisher. Fisher here. City of La Mesa, Council Member Shu. Here. City of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez. Here. City of National City, Vice Mayor Molina. Present. City of Oceanside, Deputy Mayor Kime. Here. City of Poway is absent. City of San Diego, uh, Council Member Campillo is absent. City of San Diego, Vice Chair Elo Rivera. Present. City of San Marcos, Council Member Musgrove. Musgrove here. City of Santee, Mayor Minto. Minto here. City of Solana Beach, Second Vice Chair Hebner. 
Hebner here. City of Vista, Council Member Melendez. Melendez present. And advisory members, Caltrans, Director, uh, Deputy Director Fox. Present. MTS, Mayor Pro Tem, Labor Gonzalez. Labor Gonzalez here. North County Transit District is absent. Imperial County is absent. USDOD is Dennis Keck. Thank you. Port of San Diego, CEO Stuyvesant. Present. San Diego County Water Authority, Director Katz. Here. San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Director Cabrera. Here. Uh, Mexico, the Consul General, Gonzalez Gutierrez. Presente. And the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association is absent. And that concludes the roll call and confirms a quorum. Before we went, uh, jump into our non-agenda comments, I'd like to take a moment to welcome a special guest today. I would like to introduce the mayor of the city of Guadalajara. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Pablo Lemus. Buenos dias. Buenos dias y, y bienvenido a San Diego. Um, there are thousands of thousands of uh, tapatios who live in our San Diego region that are part of our community and part of our culture. So I want to thank the Consul General, Carlos Gonzalez, for working closely with us to coordinate the visit. Así que bienvenido, Presidente. Eh, Presidente, ya le, ya, ya le di otro trabajo. <laughs> Presidente Municipal, es, estamos muy contentos de que está con nosotros. And so with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin today's meeting with non-agenda public comments. This is uh, for public and member non-agenda comments. Uh, just a reminder, uh, per our board policy, the amount of time allotted for each verbal public comment is determined based on the number of agenda items, the complexity of those items, and the number of persons anticipated to offer comment. This has allowed us to hear from as many people as possible and to complete our business while we still have quorum. We have several uh, substantive items on our agenda today to get through and are already planning to stay uh, past noon. So based on those factors for today's meeting, each member of the public will be allowed one minute for their comments. Uh, thank you again. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to public comments and turn it over to uh, Tessa. We have five total commenters on non-agenda. The first two are in person, Alan C, please go ahead. Good morning, board. I sent an email and a picture what I should like to show up on the screen. I'm pretty proud of that picture. Yet, Brown, against the Brown Act, you're preventing us from showing our PowerPoint slides. On that picture, a week ago, we celebrated lifting the cruising ban in National City. Vice Mayor National City, she actually acknowledged me this morning, shook my hand, yet my chair who represents me did not even acknowledge me, but she acknowledged all the union reps. Where do you stand on that, Mayor? So uh, yes, I'm talking about public, don't interrupt me. Uh, at that event, we had David Alvarez, Senator David Alvarez. I told him that it's phenomenal. You're back in to lift the cruise ban. Our history, rich history of our lowriders, we have murals on the families that died. I told him that you're pushing the road use tax, taking away our history. And he said, really? I didn't know it was being bypassed and go through CARB, which our Vargas here can actually do that. You can actually stop it or move it forward. And he said he will look into it and prevent that from happening. I asked his board to do the same. Because that road use tax is taking away your livelihood. You raise the price of delivery trucks, it's going to raise the price of everything. I yield back. Our next speaker is Truth. Please come to the podium. All right, this is Truth, the official disruptor of Sandag. Uh, Nora, I used your stats last meeting where you said $9 million was spent on unaccompanied children riding transit for free with only 50,000 unique rides. That means only 0.007% of the population is using the transit, my friend, for $9 million. Now here's a mashup of the meeting. None of you city council members or mayors seem to have gotten an invite to in February. The great binational mega region that must be consolidated by the United Nations 230 agenda. The, the goals that the United Nations um, won for the cities for the horizon of 2030. Guided through the 2030 agenda, creating once again uh, a mechanism that will be in some way supranational, but we'd have this binational association of governments. First test, it's actually today, the first first experiment. 
It's all the UN's Agenda 2030 plan. Nothing American. So you guys better speak up now before you lose us all and this country with your silence. Our last three public speakers are virtual. The first is Lily Irani, who will be followed by Louise Hickman and the final speaker, Blair Beekman. Lily, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for this time. Um, I'm here to speak about an um, item on the consent, consent agenda. My friend CB is a wheelchair user in San Diego and cannot be here and asked me to read on his behalf. Uh, so he writes, fact SD has failed to provide service twice now uh, for him, even though for something as basic as a ride to the airport. Um, I know that this happened in the last two months. There need to be more providers of accessible transit in San Diego, not just one. Thank you very much. I see the rest of my time. I would like to remind our public speakers, this is for non-agenda items. Uh, Louise Hickman, please go ahead. Hi, um, I would like to comment on the Access to All program. I am a researcher on disability and um, human rights. Um, on the 31st of December 2019, the uh, Super Shuttle closed down its services in and out of San Diego Airport. The Super Shuttle was a valuable service for those who are wheelchair users in the region. Since the service has um, been taken away, we have lost the ability to have multiple services available and um, to move around San Diego County. And um, disabled riders are looking for options to have on-demand rides and the ability to book those on short request. This is fundamental for the livelihood of disabled people who have a wide range of access needs. Thank you. Our final speaker is Blair Beekman. Blair, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Blair Beekman here. Uh, we have some very distinguished guests from Mexico today, Mexico, muchas, muchas gracias. Again, it seems a well-reasoned, friendly, important narrative is establishing itself in San Diego that can considerably lessen the initial SDPD ask of new ALPRs and its budgeting dollars for FY24. Let's hope we are at a good beginning towards more open, efficient guidelines and practices uh, with community surveillance technology in San Diego at this time. Um, I also wanted to comment uh, the uh, but sick bus driver situation, bus drivers calling in sick is growing way out of proportion. And you guys got to develop some strategies to get bus drivers on the routes more often. Uh, and finally, uh, just uh, to consider that we are working UN ideas and plans. We have a real important obligation to make those plans uh, really, really humanistic at the local level. And so that means good work from all of us to make these things really human. Thank you. And that concludes the public comments at this time. Thank you. And uh, my apologies to uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Lemus. Este, se me pasó y no vi que le íbamos a dar unos cuantos minutos para que pudiera hablar, así que si nos puede acompañar. Uh -huh. So I'm going to ask him to um, give him a couple of minutes. I, I meant to do that sooner. Bienvenido. Good morning, everyone to the authorities and members of SANDAG and representatives of the government of the city of San Diego. Thank you very much for receiving us this day to talk about the experience throughout these two years in the charge of government of Guadalajara. I would like to make my message in Spanish, if you don't mind. Quisiera dar un poco de contexto de nuestra ciudad. Guadalajara es un área conurbada de nueve municipios donde vivimos 5.5 millones de personas. Una ciudad con muchos retos, sobre todo en materia de desigualdad. El estado de Jalisco tiene 125 municipios en total y vivimos 8.5 millones de personas en él. Tenemos una lógica muy complicada en torno 
sobre todo a la recaudación fiscal. En México pocas personas pagan impuestos y esto hace que los municipios, los condados, tengan pocos recursos para realizar infraestructura. Para que ustedes puedan dimensionar la problemática que tenemos, Guadalajara con 1.5 millones de habitantes, me refiero solamente el municipio, tenemos aproximadamente 320 millones de dólares para dar todos los servicios y suministrar la infraestructura necesaria para nuestro municipio. Guadalajara eh, es una ciudad que aunque tiene 1.5 millones de habitantes, en realidad todos los días recibe a 3 millones de personas, pues los otros municipios dormitorio suministran a los trabajadores de la capital del, de Jalisco para que pueda desenvolver todas sus actividades económicas. Hemos creado el Instituto Metropolitano de Planeación, que es una especie parecida, un organismo parecido a Sandag. Desde él, los nueve municipios conurbados estamos tomando las decisiones en materia de infraestructura para la ciudad. Eh, el gobierno del estado de Jalisco suministra también ciertos recursos para la infraestructura metropolitana que hasta ahora es insuficiente. Uno de los grandes retos que tenemos en nuestra ciudad es que per cápita somos la ciudad en México que tiene el mayor número de automóviles. Es decir, la ciudad se construyó en su momento pensando solamente en el desplazamiento a través del automóvil. Desde hace 10 años a la fecha, hemos tomado la decisión de invertir más bien en infraestructura de transporte público, peatones y ciclistas para mejorar la movilidad en la ciudad y reducir los efectos de gas invernadero en nuestra ciudad. Un poco de contexto también. Aunque tengo dos años como alcalde de Guadalajara, la realidad es que tengo ocho años consecutivos como alcalde de nuestra ciudad. Previamente fui alcalde del municipio de Zapopan, donde celebramos muchas obras de las cuales hoy rinden a la ciudad como un modelo a nivel nacional en recuperación de espacios públicos, parques unidades deportivas, ciclovías, sistemas de transporte que hemos efectuado en la ciudad. Para mí es un honor poder estar en Sandag esta mañana para poder aprender de ustedes. Principalmente venimos a aprender del modelo que ustedes han establecido para poder tomar las mejores decisiones en torno a la ciudad con la infraestructura adecuada en materia de movilidad, de servicios públicos municipales, porque ahora la ciudad tiene un problema muy grave que lo vemos también en distintas partes del mundo, que es el manejo de residuos también en nuestra ciudad, en las tres etapas, en la recolección, en la transferencia y en la disposición de los residuos sólidos de nuestra ciudad y queremos aprender de la experiencia de la ciudad de San Diego. Para mí es un honor poder representar a Guadalajara esta mañana aquí en Sandag, porque debo decirles algo. Guadalajara representa la mexicanidad en el mundo. Nuestra ciudad tiene 481 años de haber sido fundada y cuando se habla del mariachi, cuando se habla del tequila, cuando se habla de la charrería en cualquier lugar del mundo, se habla siempre de Guadalajara. Muchas gracias a Sanda, a todas y todos sus integrantes por recibirnos y de verdad estamos muy honrados de poder aprender de la experiencia de Sanda, agradeciendo que nos reciban y por supuesto agradeciendo todas las atenciones de Sanda y de nuestro cónsul general de México en la ciudad de San Diego. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos, Presidente Municipal, y por sus comentarios. Is, um, the next item on the agenda is non-agenda member comments at this time. Do we have any non-member comments? Uh, Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I'm going to be brief. First of all, 
Thank you for allowing us the opportunity for the mayor, Mayor Pablo Lemus, to speak to all of you. Uh, we're going to have a very busy agenda throughout the day, different activities. You are all cordially invited to the Comic Con Museum this afternoon, where we're going to be inaugurating the Trino exhibit. Trino, the greatest cartoonist Mexico has. He's from Guadalajara, and um, the mayor has very kindly come to join him during the reception. But if I may, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I would like to recognize and congratulate SANDAC members and staff for their leadership in securing resources and support to develop the 2025 regional plan. Today, the board of directors will participate in the second workshop to discuss the strategy that the agency will follow to accomplish projects and programs that will benefit the future of this region. As a non-voting member of the SANDAC Board of Directors, it is encouraging to witness these discussions. It is undeniable that some of the projects and programs to be considered will have a positive impact in these binational regions connectivity. Having this crucial positive impact in mind, I would like to strongly recommend the honorable members of this Board of Directors to consider the benefits of including the cross-border trolley project as a priority project for the 2025 regional plan. The project's benefits adequately align with the regional plan's vision of a convenient, equitable, healthy, and safe transportation network, mainly in three ways. First, it will reduce the border wait times for thousands of daily commuters that come from Mexico every day to work and to study. Two, this will help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, meeting environmental justice for border communities. And three, the project will promote orderly and regular border crossings between Mexico and the United States. On the Mexican side, this project has received considerable support from the federal, state, and municipal governments. And initial discussions have started with SANDAG and the project developers, Cordova Corporation. From the Consulate General of Mexico in San Diego, we look forward to seeing the cross-border trolley as a priority project of the 2025 regional plan and to continue collaborating as an advisory member to this honorable board. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Um, seeing no other uh, members and non-agenda member comments, we're going to move up to uh, agency comments. So I'm going to turn it over to Hassan. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I didn't fully appreciate that we were doing the member comments right now. Thank you. Um, I have a very short comment, and that is on Tuesday, an entity called the Surface Transportation Board in Washington, D.C., decided not to make a ruling on a request by the North County Transit District regarding the oversight or what North County Transit District has to do as they make improvements, structural improvements on the bluff. And what that means to this Sandag board is that the prior approval by the Coastal Commission that requires that Sandag design and build a crossing as well as other public facilities, so visitor amenities in Del Mar, stands. And so where we are right now is that things will move forward. Um, separately from that, there's a question of fencing along the railroad tracks in Del Mar, and that will return to the state courts and be decided at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the officials from Mexico for attending today. Um, I do have to make a brief comment, though, when I hear the words transborder, it immediately uh, comes to my mind that we are facing one of the largest environmental disasters in the history of Southern California, which is the transborder sewage problem, which is currently closing, as it has for many years, but currently closing the beaches in Coronado and Imperial Beach. And I would just like to make a comment that we would greatly appreciate any support and continued support um, from the officials from Mexico and helping us remedy this uh, massive health and environmental disaster. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member. I, I will say that um, in a historic, I would say I've been working on the Tijuana River Valley and and the uh, issue regarding the the Tijuana River Valley, particularly the the, the contamination for over. I was a staffer for the congressman in 1993, 92. That's how long this issue has been going on. And I think for the first time since then, we have never seen the type of commitment what we've seen from not only the federal government, the state government, and the local government in Mexico. Uh, Governor, Governor Marina del Pilar, uh, the mayor of uh, uh, Montserrat from Tijuana and uh, president have not only been true partners in this process, we've signed MOUs, but they've also have been investing uh, a lot of dollars to ensure that that infrastructure happens. And so I actually had a conversation with the EPA yesterday about it. And so I think there's a lot of good work to ha be happening, something that we need to continue to elevate. But I, I want to make sure that I highlight, especially because um, our friends from Mexico are here today, that we've never seen that type of, of uh, investment made from the Mexican government in partnership with the United States. So I appreciate that. And I want to make sure that I acknowledge them as well. Uh, with that, we're going to and uh, do the agency updates. So I'm going to turn it over to Hassan. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Good morning to all of you. And again, I want to add my welcome to the mayor of Guadalajara here to Sandag. Uh, last week, um, together with Caltran District Director, uh, a press conference was held to celebrate Infrastructure Week. I think in San Diego, we have a lot to celebrate because we're investing in the future of San Diego, creating jobs, for San Diegans. Uh, as you know, state and federal fundings are important part uh, of, of keeping our priority moving forward. Let me touch on our priorities and give you a little update. On Los An, uh, as we announced a couple of weeks ago, we did receive $100 million with NCTD, with our partners, um, for San Diego Bridge to replace a 107-year-old bridge. We are awaiting anxiously uh, an award from the federal government of 135 million, which would make this bridge replacement and a new platform at the Del Mar background, playground um, completely funded. And we're ready to put shovels in the ground if we receive the federal funding. To that end, I have a, a meeting scheduled with the administrator of Federal Rail Administration next week that I will be discussing with him who visited us a few weeks back, uh, hopefully informing him that we received the state grant and hopefully receiving the federal grant. In addition, we've been trying, uh, now that we started the environmental and design work for moving the track of the bluff, we're trying to make sure that we federalize this project. And I'll be discussing with the administrator uh, our ability to federalize it so we get the NEPA clearance as early as possible. So the San Diego bridge replacement, moving the track of the plus, have started almost half a million dollars received from both state and federal governments is put to work, putting people to work in San Diego. A note I said too, I was an honor to have a discussion yesterday with the administrators of federal highways. As we speak, uh, they're meeting in the White House today, all the federal agencies, Custom Patrol, General Service Administration, Federal Highways, Build America Bureau. Uh, as a result of our leadership, uh, Chair Vargas, uh, First Vice Chair Ilio Rivera, Second Vice Chair um, Lisa Hibner, um, uh, urging uh, a great deal of work on the federal part. As a result, the White House is taking uh, an initiative to meet on OTA2. They're meeting today. Uh, we think we have a path forward, and I'm very much hoping in the next couple of weeks we get some good news about moving forward on the design with our partner at District 11 of OTA Mesa 2. We are uh, hoping that this investment will continue to create jobs, continue to attract federal and state funding. Let me just say we are positioned to receive several billion dollars uh, on uh, all these projects, especially the Los An, 
because it got some national attention to actually make moving the track of the bluff a reality. Last week, um, our staff led by our Chief Deputy Executive Director, Ray Major, our Director of Communication, Robin, were in Sacramento. They met with Secretary Amashakan to talk about what I missed too. And they also met with the Lieutenant Governor, Elena Konolakis, to talk about what I missed too. But together with our partners in District 11, Gustavo uh, Dilarda and, and Mario Orso, uh, we we'll, uh, continue to work hard to moving these priorities for the region. On the airport uh, connection, the rail connection, this board later this month will hear the possible alternatives to connect rail to the airport. Uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, several options and we have a staff recommendations for you to move forward. We are awaiting some grants from federal and state governments on that, but the work is progressing. And then last week at the Transportation Committee, and uh, the committee heard a discussion about the blue line configuration, the purple line, and um, it's a great discussion. And we would hope that we will uh, be able to do all the work needed. On the smart corridors, the 52, the 78, the 155 interchange, uh, we are positioned to get the funding needed to move this project forward to environmentally clear, design. I know the Mayor Minto knows this, the 52 has been in discussion for a long time. It's time to, to act. Um, we're working with our partners in Caltrans District 11 to make the 52 is the fairest um, um, freeway in the state to actually get some smart corridor money, um, uh, at least in, in, in a pilot form. Last week also, um, part of the budget approval we extended the 18th young and younger youth pass for another three years. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, I will miss you at the next board meeting. On the 9th, I will be uh, in Europe uh, at Brussels speaking at the 14th um, World Congress uh, on our region on behalf of Sandag, uh, a gathering to talk about challenges of urbanism uh, as we move forward. I would like to thank my team. You, you are lucky as I am uh, to uh, have an amazing people, professional who work here on behalf of the region to continue bringing uh, federal and state funding uh, to this region. So um, my executive team uh, and all of my team, uh, thank you for the great work. That concludes my report. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I just want to make sure, as you remember, I want to give you an, a quick update. Uh, I want to thank all of the, the SANDAG team for all the work that they've been doing, um, particularly uh, to make sure that we get the funding that we need. So thank you for that. I, the last couple of weeks have been really big for the work that we've been doing. We passed the $1.2 billion uh, budget last time that we were here, and I, didn't th I don't think we had a, a time to just actually process all of that and what it meant. And so I just want to make sure that I emphasize how important this was. Um, we did that with uh, representation from all cities uh, in the county. And so some of the major regional projects that we're going to that we're going that we actually supported include not only the Otay Mesa Port of Entry, the Los Sun Corridor and a transit connection to the airport, but also projects that improve all of our communities in the near term as well. And so, as had been mentioned, you know, the non-cost non transit for anyone under 18 um, and um, and under to the HOV lanes and the five and 78 connectors for SI 94, 125, the 78 and the 15 and the 78.5, truck climbing lane on the 52, bright projects, funding for housing and everything in between. I think what this budget does is does something for everyone, and I hope that we're all helping to make sure our constituents have that information. And um, and on that note, I also want to thank all of the participants in the Bike Anywhere Day. Last week, we saw an unprecedented number of board members got, that got involved, so thank you to all of you that participated in that. Um, we actually had uh, more than 7,500 members of the public is, visited one or four, one or more of the 100 pit stops throughout San Diego region. 
And I also wanted to provide an update uh, in addition to this, to the independent performance audit of recruitment. Uh, I, as you are aware, uh, we are in the process of the recruitment process this week. The board members were sent a copy of the draft um, job description. So hopefully all of you received that job description and uh, you were all asked to provide comment and input regarding the recruitment. And I've I hope that you're taking the opportunity to do that. Also, um, our recruiter reached out to all of you to sign up for some time to talk about the recruitment process. I think this is really important. And if you didn't receive the email, please let us know so that we can make sure that you get it. The other thing is that the position is gonna be advertised early next week and sent to more than a thousand potential candidates. During the first week of July, screening interviews will be held to determine which candidates will move forward to be considered by the audit committee for the first round of interviews on July 14th. So things are happening pretty fast. Uh, the finalists, uh, final can uh, candidates are gonna come to the board for the second round of interviews. And once we have our preferred candidate, an employment contract will be negotiated and approved by the September, uh, early September meeting. I've also asked Pam, the recruiter, to send the timeline to all of you so that you all have the details as well of like how this is gonna work. So it's not just me telling you right now, but you have that information in front of you. And, um, and so I think we're, that process is moving forward as this is one of the very important positions uh, that are held here at Sandeg. The other thing I, I um, said I would make sure that I share with all of you is the update on process improvements. We've talked about this because I think it's important as board members you know uh, where we stand. And so I wanted to share that the staff has streamlined its contracts, closeout procedures, which is allowed to catch up on a backlog of, of 378 closeouts in the past six months. We've also have updated our policies related to management on the fleet program and installed GPS devices on all of our fleet vehicles so that we can ensure vehicles are being used for business purposes only and that employees are driving safely. Um, and lastly, just a reminder that responses to the RENA survey, there's been a lot of discussion about RENA, particularly during the board uh, discussion strategy meeting that we had. And so um, the, the due date was May 12, but I wanted to thank Sandex staff for also hosting meetings with staff from each of our cities and the county to provide an overview of the survey, the questions, request feedback on the survey and answer questions on the RENA, number, uh, RENA reform process. So if you have any more questions or you need additional information, uh, feel free to contact the, the team or the California Housing Future 2040. Um, with that, uh, I also want to say uh, to Santa Staff, they continue to participate in this process and they're going to be part of the stakeholder meetings as well. So make sure that you stay tuned to what happens next. We're going to be hearing an update on this item at our joint executive regional planning committee meeting on July 14th. With that, I'm going to turn it over to public comments. Yes, sir. Just uh, for the board directors, a couple of items. Uh, last week, I, I told you about an issue on the state route 125. Uh, about uh, the reporting to DMV and missing some data. We're still working to figure out the impact and working to correct that issue, but I will be reporting to you once once we know it. And, and finally, um, as you know, a couple of months ago, we had a discussion in closed session about the lease. Um, our lease is up uh, in September. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market. There is a lot of people who's uh, looking to, to host us, but we will be having another closed session coming up with the board to update you on, on, on those activities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to public comment. Thank you, Chairwoman. I currently have two in-person and two virtual public commenters on this item. The first public comment is from Truth. Please come to the podium. Hello again. La agenda 2030 is Nacionales Unidas de So, Nora, was your update today what CARB told you to push yesterday at their meeting? And bike anywhere. You know, if you all don't permanently give up your cars for those same bikes, then nobody wants to hear any more climate change cult lies. And Hassan. Ah, what future, the totalitarian one you've been building with, what was that, the World Congress? Great. Now, last meeting, you talked about your California 100 commission meeting. Well, they're pushing things like genetically modified soy, fake meat, and cell-based meat. Let's see, and the commission also pushed the toxic COVID clot shots that have resulted in a record number of suddenly died healthy people. But how come you're not eating that GM fake meat, Asana, as part of your taxpayer-funded lunches? Maybe you should reconsider your diet. 
because at the April 28th meeting, I counted a minimum of 10 sweat wipes, and that's just what was on video. So that's either a sign of bad health or a sign of guilt constantly pouring out from the wrongs that are happening here at San. Thank you. Your time expired. Our next speaker is Alan C., who will be followed by our first virtual speaker, Blair Beekman. Alan, please come. To Thank you. Th thank you. Yeah, a little technical thing. I would love to have heard that mayor, but I couldn't understand him. Possibly closed captioning. We could do closed captioning so we can all, I'd like to hear what he said. In respect to that, I was also the hypocrisy that members of your constituents would allow one minute, yet a person who is not even of our country allowed as much time to speak. Talk about hypocrisy. Speak up, people. We're taking away our freedom. Concerning your uh, bike program, how many tables set up? 2,000 tables. How many delivery trucks? And yet you want to take away roads? And uh, Mr. Hassan, thank you for talking about the Delmar track. I spoke about it last June. The governor released $100 million a week later. We're approaching a year later. Where are the shovels? You had a study since 2018. I've got the documents of moving that track. When are we going to do it? It needs to happen now. Stop dragging our feet and stop paying so called consultants raking our money in, move the tracks now because people are gonna die if that train falls in the bluff. Look at the 1940 train crash where people died. Move it now, please. I yield back. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman, who will be followed by the final speaker, Catherine Rhodes. Blair, go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, the mayor of Guadalajara talked about trash issues, among other things, uh, to note a very interesting uh, lecture that you can use a. a English interpretation device on the Zoom link, which was helpful. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to comment on the CEO's comments uh, about the purple line that I feel is an in, a very interesting idea that was spoken how it can really be needed with a, a growth in population in the next uh, uh, coming decades. Uh, it may really be needed. Uh, uh, maybe not. If if not, that can be good too. But if it is needed, I hope that uh, it can be considered the importance of uh, there may be uh, wanting of biometric technology placed on those purple lines. Uh, I don't know if that's a good idea. I hope we can argue against it. And if we do have to have it, that we have good open public policies that we can talk about. We can talk about these things more easily now. I hope we can talk about these things openly. Uh, in the future of the Purple Line process. Thank you. Our final speaker, Catherine Rhodes, please go ahead. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and this is um, for Hassan. If you're going to meet with the Federal um, Transportation Administration, great. Please ask them about the um, January 12th, 2021 memorandum from the FAA for passenger facility charge updates called PFC 75-21. Um, and what that will do is it, that will allow you to um, do a lot of things that you wanna do without a tax increase because you can now use um, airport revenue. Please ask them if we're still a grandfathered airport similar to New York and New Jersey where they tried to take out their um, grandfather status and they fought them and they won. and. And that would open up so much money. And then it also says um, in, in the document, um, they encourage development of intermodal connections on airport property between aeronautic and other transportation modes and systems to serve transportation passengers and cargo efficiently. And that, um, and, and that would mean that you would do your central mobility hub or things like that um, at the point. Thank you, your time expired. That concludes the public commenters on this item. Thank you, uh, Mayor Crump. Thank you. Um, uh, CEO Decrada mentioned the Infrastructure Week uh, press conference, and I'm sure it was uh, important to have that. I would like to request that it not be scheduled to create a hard stop in the Transportation Committee meetings. Um, we were, um, we didn't get to hear one of the items that was on the agenda and the discussion about the uh, purple and the uh, blue line express uh, conversation was rushed. And uh, I was also disappointed that no one from MTS was involved in that conversation. So um, in the interest of my time, which I take out of my work day to come to these meetings uh, to accomplish as much as possible, I would appreciate some consideration for the importance of those meetings before scheduling press conferences. Thank you, Sarah. My apologies for, for running over.
Thank you. Um, Mayor Dunk, Council Member Dunk. For now, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, just a qu uh, quick comment um, or question, I should say. Is there anywhere, are, are any of the boards or committees informed in full or, or about when and what press conferences are occurring from this agency? Because for instance, I just thought it was very strange to be leaving the transportation committee and see a, a press co conference going on that was actually, they were talking about Coronado and transportation issues and I had no idea it was actually occurring. And not that I need to be part of it, I understand only certain people will be chosen to be part of the press conferences, but I wouldn't mind observing them and knowing when they're happening. Yeah, so what we could do is we'll make sure that uh, we share that information with everyone. Um, a lot of times what happens is uh, the team is asking me to come and speak. So I um, I will go ahead and ask my first vice chair or second vice chair to go speak on my behalf or any of the council members if they're in that community. And so we try to figure it out. Some of the times we don't have a lot of a heads up, right? Because as you know, media and earned media happens when things are happening at the moment. But we're going to do everything we can and I'll put it back on the team to make sure that if um, there are issues that are happening, that people know with as much time as possible. We will, we will, we will take care of it. Yeah, no, I'd appreciate that because this one was definitely not a last minute planned. It was a very well planned yeah. orchestrated event, including the chair of the committee that I just walked out being in there as well as state officials and various other officials. So that's the type of one I understand. Certainly you're going to do press conferences elsewhere and other things are going to happen, but just it would, I, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Good. You got it. Um, who else do I have? Uh, Sandra, quickly, I was uh, I was taking notes and following behind your presentation. When you mentioned the smart corridors and specifically 52 and 78, uh, can you elaborate on the funding source? And when you said 78, what portion of it? Was it the express lanes, I-5, I-15? Yeah. So let me, uh, and Colleen, we'll, we'll get to the specifics. Uh, as I said before, uh, our plan is a multimodal plan, and, and we made it very clear that whether it's uh, the 52 in the, that goes to East County or the 78 that's in the North County, we're trying to uh, use the state processes and funding to actually make the express um, lanes that's proposed on the 78 go faster, uh, but also to make sure that the interchanges, the 1578, the 155, uh, have the enough funding to move the environmental forward. But I'll let Colleen talk about the potential for partnering with Caltrans. Caltrans now is looking for uh, candidates around the state. And we stand in the front of the line on the 5278 smart corridors. But I'll let Colleen elaborate. Very briefly, council members. So in the budget that you all approved in the capital budget, there's specific improvement projects proposed. And so when we're looking at the 1578, it's a combination of transnet, some federal dollars, and I can get the exact funding sources for you on that. And throughout the capital budget, that's that's how the projects work. There's usually a portion of transnet and then matching with state and federal. And then the additional funding that we're looking for is actually through the, the Caltrans um, carbon reduction program where they're looking to fund technology improvements to make the system work better. So we're gonna be working with you all on where we wanna focus those grant applications. So happy to get more detail to you if, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that, so to add just to that, both uh, Congressman Isa and, and Congressman Levin have put a uh, request appropriation for, for the interchanges on, on the 1578, 155. So we're trying to uh, leverage a lot more money to do more smart corridor work. Great, thank you. And I look forward to the more detailed information. All right, with that, um, I'm gonna move. Oh, sorry. Is it, I'm sorry, um, uh, Hassan. Is thing not working? I didn't raise my hand, sorry. Okay. He just said this multiple times, so I'm just trying to get on there. So, so you're saying the 15-5, but there is no 15-5. Are you, are you meaning the 1578? Yes. Yes. Okay, got it, just making clarity, thank you. Okay, so just a reminder, you use your um, little machine so that I can see you, otherwise it's hard, um, and uh, we can move on. All right, no problem, I need to apologize. All right, moving on to the consent agenda, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to public comment. I'd like to remind the commenters that you have one minute to speak on all the items within the consent agenda. <clears throat> Our first speaker is Alan C, who will be followed by Arun Prem. Alan, please come to the podium. 
Just want to say thank you to the clerk. She put me in at the last second to speak with the last, I don't know, I'm not sure you like that or not. Uh, yeah, concerning the uh, transit, I basically said no to item, which it, when is it uh, item, uh, uh, item five, because uh, who are you to di dictate who gets the funding, who doesn't? The city of Poway was denied. Is it because they're, you don't want, uh, they don't want to take away R1 zoning and, and you want them to? Like the state, it, it, that that is that is wrong. That is wrong to actually deny any taxpayer their due funding to their city. And who decides that? Is it this entire board, or is it just your your henchmen to decide? You get the funding, but you don't. Yet me as a taxpayer, I paid for that funding. Transit, we've been paying since 1987. We're paying to 2040 transit funding, and yet you're going to take it away because they don't meet your little rules. That that is that is pure wrong. Everybody here should be fighting for that. That is so wrong to take away my tax money because it doesn't meet the one person's up there. Thank you. Your time expired. Okay. Our next speaker, Arun Prem, will be followed by Udayan Tan Don. Good morning, everybody. Arun Prem from FACT speaking on item six, access for all cycle two. FACT will roll out the new access for all cycle one service on June 1st. As of June 1st, you will be able to call FACT for a wheelchair accessible vehicle ride and get the ride within one hour. With respect to cycle two of Access for All, I support the TC recommendation. Staff item for the TC stated, there are dozens of wave providers in this region already. Given that, TC questioned the need for funding more startups versus proceeding, uh, providing as many rides as possible as soon as possible. FACT uses local taxi cab services to provide wave rides, and we welcome all vendors to join our efforts in enhancing specialized transportation in San Diego. Thank you. Our next speaker, Odayan Tandon, will be followed by Peter Shish. Hi, I'm Odayan Tandon. I'm a PhD student at the Design Lab at UC San Diego. I'm here to speak about item six, access for all cycle two. And I support all the effort that has gone into incorporating new providers into cycle two, but I urge Sandag to do more to incorporate uh, new providers into the access for all program. Uh, the need for truly on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicles is urgent. Uh, and we need more diverse accessible transportation options in San Diego. As a designer by training, I recognize that we need diverse options to be able to provide the service well. The current benchmark for 12 hours is not truly on demand. We need to reduce that to 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And we have a wealth of experience in the locally regulated taxi industry of doing on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicle transit in San Diego. We should support their efforts. We should support providers like United Taxi Workers San Diego who have uh, gotten a locally regulated app enabled and are ready to incorporate wheelchair accessible vehicles. Thank you, your time expired. Peter, our next speaker will be followed by Mikhail Hussein. Hi, my name is Peter Zishi. I'm um, probably the most active board member at United Taxi Workers. And many decades ago, I was a shipyard worker in San Diego, and I appreciated the need for working class communities to have the appropriate skills to, to thrive in, our, in San Diego. Um, more recently, I served as 16 years as a trustee in the community college district in San Diego. And really, my passion was to deliver skills to people in our community that could, that could economically thrive and be part of a vibrant San Diego community. Our taxi industry is stuck in the 20th century. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large industry. There's no large employers. This is 750 small business people trying to make it on 20th century methods. Taxi workers have devoted seven years to developing a new taxi meter that is GPS based. It is now state certified. We believe that we can deliver new and unique uh, on-demand services for wheelchair vehicles. We've been part of the MTS effort to study this issue, study this issue, and we're part of uh, their effort to have an emerging policy at MTS within the taxi Thank industry. Thank you. Your time expired. Makes us contribute. We want to be a new provider. Thank you. Mikhail Hussein will be followed by our final in-person speaker, Truth, who will be followed by our final three online virtual speakers. Uh, good morning. My name is Mikhail Hussein. I'm the executive director for United Sex Workers of San Diego. 
Um, just to, I know one minute stuff, but you know, UTW is this participating effort for the SANDAG, all the work that they have been doing. But unfortunately, last Friday, when transportation committee and uh, talking about discussion about all four options, we never really invite us, and we definitely need to be part of that group next time. Because, you know, uh, fact, they were there actually fighting for uh, all, means that item number four, option four, I mean. So, but we are looking for 30, uh, 70 uh, for the team for the SENDAC approval. I think that's something that we are looking for. If you guys can uh, adopt that, that would be great. If not, UTWSD is here. We, this time we are unique and we are planning to do actually uh, on demand service. And we are really actually need opportunity to give us. So we are here actually, we are serving for the community last 15 years and we will continue to do so. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Catherine Rhodes is our next speaker who will be followed by Blair Beekman. Catherine, please go ahead. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes and I was talking about number 10, the auditor's fraud, waste and abuse report. On page 47 on table two, um, number seven was my issue that, you know, that I've been bringing up for um, to Sandeg now for like 17 years. And that is to when you do your fault investigations, that you have somebody do a third party review and then you turn them into the state within 30 days of the approval. And then also to reconvene the 2006 Coronado Technical Advisory Panel for seismic issues specifically rate related to the airport connectivity project, because you'll be passing, um, I would say, one, two, four active faults. And you should know where it is as soon as possible um, before you, you know, decide. Um, the, the option of what you're going to do. And so um, right now it hasn't even been started. It's open, it's pending, but um, I'm just hoping that the auditor will start working on this, call me up so I could give them all the information. Nobody's ever called. Thank you, your time expired. I do need to call one more in-person speaker. Truth, please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, item four, the minutes in public comment spelled the original draw name incorrectly. Item six, they're trying to make ride hailing companies wheelchair accessible. Not sure how people using their personal cars as Uber or Lyft could afford to do that. Item seven, for $950,000, the audit committee wants the firm Davis Farr LLP to conduct the Sandag audits. This is their first whack at it, so that'll work in fraud's favor. Uh, item nine, Hassan bought four securities for $10.5 million from nefarious companies such as Colgate and Coca-Cola. Also over $124,000 was wasted on a toll lane on the 805. Item 10, there are eight cases of fraud, waste, and abuse so far to have been partially substantiated. I recommend that more people file more complaints. And item eight mentions Sandag's Argus. Here's info from Bill Wells for the public's knowledge. Sandag does the same thing with Argus. And basically, on overpasses all throughout San Diego, there is a camera that, that takes a picture of every license plate that goes under that overpass. And that's through your time the, expired. Uh, Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman, who will be followed by the final speaker, Casa EJ. Blair, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman, to better clarify my words from previous public comment, good luck, how in dealing with UN issues that we practice the concepts of good open democracy at the local level uh, between us. That can help a lot. Uh, to comment on the meetings and agendas on the consent calendar attended by board persons, there was a, a April 24th Institute of the Americas at UC Davis meeting uh, event that with the uh, mayor of Guadalajara here, I thought it would be nice to mention and a real good luck in things like the purple line in concepts of like mixed income housing ideas that are really important to the future of California that we have to be working on very soon. Uh, good luck on how to bring those ideas to Tijuana and their development. Uh, they have a real large development planning going on right now. Good luck how it can be of help there as well, uh, mixed income ideas. And, and to be considering uh, the, the incredible work that Guadalajara does uh, with uh, Vision Zero kind of ideas, thanks. Thank you, your time expired. Our final speaker is Casa EJ, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Alejandro Mador with Casa Familiar. 
And today I wanna to talk about item 12 to elevate the priorities of our border region. Um, time and time again, we see the border region uh, reporting the highest level of particulate matter and black carbon in the county. So for the uh, regional plan, we want to elevate our priorities projects that will address this issue and show Sandex commitment to equity projects that will directly impact the livelihood of our historically marginalized underinvested communities and our border region. So we own projects that prioritize the efficiency over the transit system, such as the Blue Line Express, the Purple Line, and the cross-border tro trolley project. Um, the state has already acknowledged that the border communities are um, specifically impacted by Dicing and NSIC Don Otay Mesa as AB617 committee. So now we must get all the stakeholders, especially SANDAC, to actively engage in binational collaboration to address this poor air quality and foster a culture shift in our transportation system. Thank you. And that concludes the public speakers. Thank you. Are there any member comments? Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Move approval. I'll second. I'll second. Um, I just wanted, the only thing I wanted to make a short comment on item number six. Um, I really do support the actions recommended by the Transportation Committee, and I also want to highlight uh, funding release for the Access for All grant program. Well, that's going to bring additional funding for our specialized transportation providers, you know, hopefully support existing and new providers with the criteria that will be approved by the board. And then we're going to look at other opportunities so that we can uh, make sure that we have a diversity in our representation. So with that, we have a motion and a second. I have a oh. comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Our so program. now, yes. So I'm gonna just remind everybody, so as soon as the uh, public comment is over, feel free to just uh, press your button because what's happening is people are not pressing the button. So I, I see no press. comments and then I just start going on with the meeting. So go ahead, Council. Uh, thank you. I just wanna be clear that in approving item number six on the agenda, we're approving as it says on page 31, the transportation committee's recommendation that 100% of the funds stay with the entity they were awarded to uh, FACT to provide the brokered uh, services for the wheelchair accessible vehicles. We had a large group of wheelchair bound people who spoke at the transportation committee meeting and that vote to not pull of the, any of the funds into a speculative uh, endeavor to give to groups that would not be providing any certain amount of, of, of uh, vehicle or transportation to the handicapped individuals um, was a unanimous vote to keep all the money again as set forth. And I just wanna make sure that's what we're approving by leaving this on the consent calendar. Yep. And I have one other comment if I can make now, I wanna make it as brief as possible, but it relates to this item number six as well okay. as item number four. Thank you. So a brief history, brief of, of my sort of frustration with, with this fact situation. So as you may recall, we had a transportation committee meeting many, many months ago. And at that meeting, cycle funding was up for approval. And there was a process where, again, in one of the slides that was at that meeting, FACT was near the top of the evaluated uh, entities to receive funding. As many of you know, um, that did not happen. When, once it went out to the outside evaluators and the new decisions were made, they were not given funding. So at that transportation committee meeting, it was voted by the transportation committee to please review the process and um, see, because we were told that the transportation committee and even this board was told that it did not have the power to correct or to change any of those uh, cycle awards. And what, and that was on the consent calendar without all that information in it when it came up to the board. So I asked that it please be pulled from the consent calendar so this board could review that issue. It was pulled. And once again, in regard to this process, for the second time, we had a unanimous vote, this time by the SANDAG board, unanimously to have that process reviewed. However, this board added a third part, which was to um, bifurcate or separate the ride fact uh, issue from the approval of the cycle funding. At that time, it was also approved by this board that staff would review alternate funding for that specific ride fact um, fund uh, program that was not funded. Okay, so that was that's just ride fact, which is different than this than the one that's before us today. The reason I bring it up is because instead of that actually happening, 
What happened now many months later at the last transportation committee and the minutes aren't here for that transportation committee meeting, even though we're looking at this uh, item number six, is that the transportation committee asked staff specifically, is anything being done to look at alternate funding for ride fact as the board unanimously voted? And we were told specifically, no, nothing's happening on that. But what was there was this item number six for the first time, at least that I'm aware of, that I've ever heard of it, where there was going to be money stripped from fax brokerage of wheelchair accessible vehicles to potentially give it to something. And I'm not saying the idea of developing entities is a, and, and DEI entities is a, is a bad thing, it's a good thing, but to take the money away from the entity that's actually funding these rides currently and having the people sit here in their wheelchairs and say this is the only way they get to their hospital and, and to cemeteries and to school is to use the service that exists and, and they were gonna strip 30% of that funding from fact. It bothers me that the council member Duncan, I don't want to cut you off, but I want to make sure that so the item on the consent agenda specifically to the transportation committee to voting on this particular issue. I understand your concern uh, specifically about where you're coming from and regarding the grants. And so my understanding is that there is a new process. So what I would like to do is I would like to bring that item back to the board and I'm going to have the executive committee address that issue bring back and I also want the team to send a memo to the council member to see where we are with that status. What I don't wanna do is have a conversation about an item that is not on the agenda, although I understand the background that you're providing. So I think it's extremely important and I understand where you're coming from. But, um, but I think it's important that um, for number one, always feel free to call the CEO and or his executive team directly on any of these issues so that you can get all the background. And if you want this item to be on an executive committee agenda so we can bring it back to the board, absolutely, because I know that was something that's pending. We have a list of pending items, and so we will bring it back. And I wanna make sure that uh, that we have an opportunity so that everybody has all the background, everybody can discuss it, and it's an actual item on the agenda, and we can talk about process. Are you good with that? I just have one comment, so it's on five seconds to answer that, okay. because I, I think you may not be aware. Um, at the transportation committee, with the final result was to do what you said to take. We took another unanimous vote to send it back to the board. It was identical to our last unanimous vote and to the board's instructions. But now it has been sent back, and I would just ask that that be given to the board or the executive board and not put in a consent calendar without that recommendation in it, like happened last time. Thank yeah, you. You got it. We're going to go ahead and move forward, Council Member. Um, so. I'm totally supportive of trying to get to these 20 minute rides, um, you know, a ride within 20 minutes if we possibly can, just to follow up. My question though is on item 10, and it's a checking my assumption question. You know, I read all these reports that we get, and item 10 is about the investment report for April of 2023. And what I see is that $10.5 million of investments matured and $11 million were bought. And so my assumption was that this is a way of managing money in Sandag so that it's available at certain times and so that we get a certain return on the money for Sandag. Um, is my assumption correct and am I reading this properly? Item number 10, who can answer? Yeah. Go ahead, let me turn it over. Yeah. Listen, go ahead. Uh, Yes. Um, the report says 10, so sorry, I have that in front of me. So if I can answer yes, that question. Nine. Thank you. Uh, okay. We have about a billion dollars uh, that we currently invest. And obviously the um, there's basically three pots of money that we have. Two is with investment managers with the PFM asset management. One is with inside investments. And then a portion of it we invest internally to kind of match our cash flow needs that we need for payroll, for accounts payable. So that's exactly right what you mentioned is some of the uh, investments mature, we spend some of the money. And if we don't spend that portion, then we go out and invest it again. So we have outside money managers investing the longer term portfolio, but staff is managing the shorter term money. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. Is there, so we have a motion, right? And a second, so please vote. That motion passes unanimously like with those members present. Any correspondence, yes. It was so mentioned. Just to clarify voting. my, uh, so we're voting right now, but to your question, uh, Mayor, 
everybody will get the information. Uh, I just want to make sure that that it's documented. I think that a lot of what happens is uh, miscommunication, where uh, when you know people have conversations and then there's things are lost in translation. So I want to make sure. And all of these items have happened in the last you know less than three months, and we have had a very, very robust agenda in each one of these meetings. And so I want to make sure that everybody understands that nothing, something's not happening. There's no ill intent. Uh, what it's happening is that we're trying to fit in a lot. We are at 1015 and we have, uh, we are on item 11, which I promised all of you as your chair, that we're going to have discussions for everything, but we want to make sure we get things done. So I will do my best to make sure that we are documenting things and that everybody gets a copy of everything, not just one person. Okay. Got it? Thank you. All right, next item is item 11, which is uh, an overview of the Transnet proposed 2023 series bond issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask, um, I understand that we have a financial advisor, uh, Mr. Schellenberger here today to walk through this so that we can ask any questions before this comes back to the board on June 9th for action. Again, today is just information to get us ready before we are asked to make a decision. So please take the time to ask any questions that you may have, Andre. Thank you, Chairwoman, and a good morning, members of the board. So as you mentioned, this is just an informational item today. We'll be coming back to the board in a couple of weeks with the entire package. Um, but th this is basically a good news item. This is what an item that we say has been through the triple jump. It went to the ITOC two weeks ago. It went to the Transportation Committee last week and before you here today. Uh, we've had good discussions at the TC and ITOC, generally with a very positive feedback. Uh, this proposed financing is beneficial as it is going to simplify our debt portfolio, eliminate potential risks, and give us the future flexibility and estimated to have a net present value savings of approximately $30 million. So besides the uh, SANDAC staff that has been working on this effort, we have also assembled the financial team. And to my left is a Peter Schellenberger. He's a managing director with a PFM, who is our financial advisor, and as well as we have the swap advisory group, because potentially we're going to be terminating our swaps. Um, we also did a procurement for our bond council and disclosure council, and Stradling was selected as a bond council. Uh, disclosure council is Norton Rose. Currently, there are 14 uh, banks in our underwriting pool. All 14 of them responded to this RFP. Uh, Wells Fargo was selected as a senior underwriter, and our co-senior underwriters are Goldman Sachs, and our co-managers on this transaction are Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, and Ramirez. So there's five different items that I'll be kind of reviewing with you here today. First of all, um, why we're proposing to issue these bonds specifically. There's a refunding of two series. There's the swap termination. We'll talk about the potential size and structure of the deal. We'll touch on the uh, credit, con uh, credit considerations. Although we don't have any bond documents today, we'll be kind of touching on them, what to expect uh, next time you see it. And then basically a calendar of events between now and when we expect to close on the deal, which is the early part of July. So in front of you here is uh, our debt portfolio. Uh, currently there's $2.3 billion outstanding. And in general, uh, this is since Transnet 2 in 2008 is when we took out the first series of bonds. And in general, we've been going to the market every two years. And you can see the last time that we went was in 2021. We have a very conservative debt portfolio. 98% of it is fixed. Only 2% of it is variable. And so even though we've had a tremendous rise in interest rates, um, our portfolio has not been materially impacted at all. In fact, I just mentioned we have a investment portfolio of a billion dollars that has seen a tremendous increase. So um, in fact, we are getting more interest on our investment portfolio than we are currently paying on our debt portfolio. Um, the bonds that we're looking to take out specifically are the 2008 series, uh, series A, B, C, and D. You can see the coupon type, this is synthetic fixed rate bonds. Generally, what that means is that they are variable rate bonds, and we have an overlay swap on them that tries to mimic them being a fixed rate bond. 
There's also the opportunity while we're in the market to take out a portion of our 2019A, which is a taxable issuance uh, to make it tax exempt, which generally tax exempt rates are lower. Looking at the composition of our bonds, the left chart shows that out of the 2.3 billion, 84% of it is fixed rate. The 16% of it is synthetically fixed rate. On the right side, you see the difference between the tax exempt and taxable. And what we're focusing on with this bond deal is again, the synthetic fixed rate bonds, taking them all out and making our entire debt portfolio fixed. And then as well as a portion of our taxable bonds. So now the question is, why are we issuing these bonds? In general, it's to lower the SANDAG's borrowing costs through debt service savings. I think uh, we've all seen the tremendous rise in um, interest rates because of inflation pressures the last year and a half. I think we haven't seen rates as high as um, they were back before the financial crisis in 2008. And so generally you say, as interest rates are going up, why are you going to refinance a bond? It turns out that our interest rate swaps are very sensitive to interest rates. And as interest rates have moved up, the value of our swaps has increased as well. Attached in the board item uh, today is a memo from PFM that basically curves out the value of our swaps, which a year and a half ago were minus $125 million. As of today, Wells Fargo's in the audience, they notified me that it was only negative $5 million. So that has tremendously helped this financing. We're going to simplify Sandex portfolio by eliminating the interest rate swaps. Um, generally, when you issue a fixed rate bond, it goes to the trustee. The trustee pays the principal and interest twice a year. When it's a variable rate bond, we are remarketing the bonds every week. Um, the accounting department has to record those uh, rates on a weekly basis. We have to have a remarketing agent that's selling those bonds on a weekly basis. We have to have standby uh, bond um, uh, um, credit issues. Um, so basically they're very complicated. And so by eliminating them, we eliminate the future risks. One of the risks that we see is item number three, the LIBOR phase out. LIBOR has been in the markets forever, but based on some scandals that were in the market 10 years ago, it's finally being phased out to a new uh, index called SOFR. SOFR is gonna be going on July 1st. Although we think that things will be orderly, we don't wanna take the risk because our swaps are tied to LIBOR, they'll be now tied to SOFR. So the opportunity there is for us to get out and actually have uh, currently a net present value savings that I'll show you here in a minute. So again, just to summarize the upcoming 23 transaction is to refund all the variable rate bonds and terminate the associated interest rate swaps as well. Take advantage while we're in the market to potentially refund some of our 2019 bonds that are taxable to tax exempt. So currently the potential size and stru structure, uh, we show 350 million to 820 million the sweet spot right now we're thinking is just under $500 million. It really depends on how the market is when we go to the market, which is gonna be the last week in June. Currently, we all see the market as a little bit dislocated because of the debt ceiling uh, discussions going on in DC. So the market is very volatile. We hope by the time we get to the market in uh, uh, late part of June, that things will have kind of simmered down a little bit, but. We've seen our net present value savings. Again, we've been in fairly volatile markets the last couple of months. Uh, go between the $22 million savings and a $35 million savings. The tax status will be a tax exempt and they'll be put on our senior lien. So every time that you go to uh, sell bonds, you have to have at least two ratings from two of the uh, major uh, rating agencies. Um, we met actually just this week, your executive and senior team with uh, Standard & Poor's and Fitch. We are currently AAA rated. That is the highest rate that you can possibly get. In fact, only 5% of municipal issuers throughout the country are AAA rated. So uh, we're at the highest levels as we are. Our current ratings on our subordinate lien are AA. We're trying to get that upgraded to a AA+. And lastly, we have our... Um, 
uh, junior subordinate lien, which is where our Fitch alone sits on, and that is a strong A+. As I mentioned, there is a financial advisor memo. I'm trying to be brief in my presentation today, but there's a lot of uh, materials that will be coming to you. Um, the potential, uh, uh, the actual memo talks about the market update, uh, more detail about the swap termination, the structure of the 2023 20, uh, bonds, the tender offer, and other financial considerations. When we come to you in two weeks, we'll actually be going to the Transportation Committee with these documents. Next week, we'll be asking the Transportation Committee to recommend to the board. I won't read all these documents, but these are the documents that will be coming to you. Uh, John Kirk, who's our legal counsel, will be describing to you. There's some fiduciary responsibilities that the uh, board has regarding these documents, and he'll get into those at that meeting. So our next steps, as I mentioned, we will be going with a full set of documents to our uh, transportation committee next week. The following week, we'll be coming uh, looking for a board approval. Once we get, and hopefully when we get the board approval, we will be posting our preliminary official statement uh, June 12th. A uh, group of us from Sandag will be uh, flying to New York the week of 26, where we'll be meeting uh, with uh, investors who generally have a number of questions on the issuance. Uh, the intent to price that week in June, and we anticipate that the uh, bonds will close uh, the week of July 10th. Chairwoman, that ends my presentation, and Peter and I will be here uh, to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful. I'm going to turn it over to public comment, and then I'll have member comment. So this is the time where you press your little button. I have two in-person public commenters and one virtual, Alan C., who will be followed by Truth. The uh, title header says Transit Proposed 2023 Bond Issue. So why are we flying to New York? Transnet is funded by the taxpayers, not investors. Let me quote Transnet since 1987. To relieve traffic congestion, improve safety, and match traffic to federal funds to expand I-5, I-8, I-15, SR-52, SR-54, SR-56, SR-67, SR-76, SR-78, I'm running out of breath, SR-94, SR-125, I-805. Maintain and improve local roads, improve transit for seniors, disabled persons, expand the commuter express, bus, trolley, coastal services. Nowhere on that ballot does it say take away road lanes for buses. Nowhere on that ballot does it say incorporate bike lanes that the bikers don't even pay a dime to. Think about that. When are you guys going to speak up? I yield back. <laughs> Our next speaker is Truth, who will be followed by the final speaker, Blair Beekman. Truth, please go ahead. Hello, Truth. Again, Nora, more English or translations will result in better communication. I don't know if you know that. Sandag's not only relying on federal debt dollars to stay propped up, along with Hassan's securities gambling, but there's also variable rate debt obligations and interest rate swaps. Does anyone here have any real money? No wonder road taxes have been pushed. Nefariously taken for the people in order to fund our future enslavement, starting with transportation and mobility elements, eventually to be expanded. And that's exactly why I'm all for the elimination of Sandag. Sandag also receives a floating payment where they can borrow dollars overnight while using treasury bonds as collateral. Well, the reality is that our country and lives are the real collateral when there's nothing backing our dollars but promises of things like debt bonds. And that brings inflation and a financial stranglehold. Sandex financing is just like their audit and a fixed rate bond, synthetic. And everything's floating away. It's all funny money. So it has no meaning. It's like monopoly. So how many of you actually understood this stuff? It sure was boring, right? Thank you. Your time expired. Our final speaker, Blair Beekman, please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, thanks for explaining the mechanics of this item, how uh, it's financial instruments, how it will work. I'm sure you'll need conversation on that. But it's from that, can, can its financial instrumentation talk about what projects it's actually going to be addressing here in Sandag? Can board members uh, speak on that a bit? Because, I mean, I'm incredibly concerned that 
at the rate that uh, bus drivers are calling in sick. And to me, it really speaks to you that they need to be paid. Uh, there needs to be incentives for them to be paid and want to not call in sick so much. It's, it's a really serious issue. I mean, people are being stranded at the bus. People are having to camp out overnight uh, because the buses won't arrive. I mean, I really hope you work on this and this sort of uh, bond funding is perfect to address these sort of things. Uh, really good luck in how to do that and, and how it can talk about ride sharing and ride sharing can be uh, non-competitive. Thank you. That concludes the public comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Council member. Thank you, Chair. Um, Andre, thank you very much for a clear report. I am fully supportive of actions that save the taxpayers money, which this does, and that makes things less complicated and more predictable. That's good for everybody in the long run. So in 2013, the city of Del Mar's city council borrowed from Sandag a certain amount of money into the future to redevelop a road and put in a traffic circle. And I learned this about a year and a half ago when I was looking for ways for Del Mar to find $3.5 million, which was what we needed for rebuilding the Camino Del Mar Bridge, which is on Highway 101 over the San Diego River. And what I learned was that our 2013 council had borrowed from Sandag all our transnet funds allocated to our local jurisdiction into the future sufficient that all of our transnet funds to Del Mar, it's about 200,000 a year, it's not a lot of money, but it adds up, it is allocated, it's tied up through 2040. So our council did something then that has had consequences and will for another 20 years. So that is an example to illustrate my question to you. My question is, you know, why does Sandag operate in debt? I would say it's pretty terrible for Del Mar to have operated in debt on this transnet fund loan. And we have to set aside in our general fund, a general fund reserve, so that we can operate as a city for anywhere from four to six months on our reserves. So I guess the question becomes, what is it about Sandag's operations that make debt needed? Is it needed? And, um, you know, what, what, that's my question. <laughs> I think that's a great question. And it's a question that we have discussed, especially at the ITOG extensively. So 2008 was when Transnet 2 was approved for the second time. Part of why we have the swaps right now is at that time, interest rates were really low. So we went and borrowed $600 million in the future, locking in the rates. Part of why we wanted to do that is uh, to accelerate some of the projects. Certainly today, we've finished the Midcoast project on time, on budget, that costs $2 billion. I would guess if we were trying to do that again today, in today's dollars, it may cost $4 billion, and that's just a guess. But my point is things generally get much more expensive in the future to build. And so even in the 2008, when we were in the recessionary period, we accelerated some of the projects and we got a really good deal. I mean, today we're in an inflationary period where it's costing us 30, 40% more to build projects. So during the recession, we accelerated projects. And in general, you know, right now, our borrowing cost, our oil and borrowing cost is 3.05%, which is very favorable. If you were to go and invest that money in a one month treasury, I'm actually getting close to 6%. So that's why actually today my investments are yielding more than what I'm paying in my debt. So overall, the idea is that to build these mega projects, these infrastructure projects, you need to need to borrow money up front. And I think our goal as a finance department is to try invest as the best rates that we can. If we see opportunities to refinance, we will. But the long and short uh, answer is generally it's, I mean, we're not the exception to the rule. Most municipalities borrow money to build these big infrastructure projects. And actually, it's worked out really well for us. I mean, we do have to maintain a debt service coverage ratio to ensure that we have enough money to build 
projects today, as well as pay our debt service fund. In fact, our debt service coverage ratio has gone up by about 40%. It used to be 2.85, now it's just over four times. So we keep a close eye on that, but I'd say that today we're in a good position, even with having outstanding debt. Oops. So kind of to turn that into a, a, a simpler view, let's make sure I understand. Basically, we know with the tax that there's money that will be coming in, totally dependable future income. And thus, you go in, you take out a bond, go into debt now in order to have that cash now in order to do these very large projects that require spending out on a regular basis. So for that, we're paying a little bit of a premium, 3% interest on that money, but we have the money and we can actually do it. And because we're doing it sooner rather than later, the dollars that are being spent are, they're, they're worth more than those future dollars. So at the end of the day, it's kind of zero sum. Am I looking at that correctly? You are correct. Thank you. If I may just comment, on our CFO is very modest. I think he's the best in the business. I have never worked with better people, better teams. But it's not only San Diego, it's a statewide, it's a country, and it's a nationwide, and it's a worldwide. Right now, the cost of projects is going up. Um, supply chain, inflation, whatever it is. I, I think the fact that we're able to, to continue to build major infrastructure project and to continue to pay our obligation is simply because of the thinking of the CFO and his team are, are doing. And, and I wanna applaud him for the way he's thinking about it. Having said that, don't be surprised if a few months from now we come to you and say, oops, you know, we, we have some issues. Uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, you, you're aware of this. This is a, a multi-billion dollar operation and therefore uh, things could change very quickly. Mayor Minto? Yeah, I just kind of want to put, I think that was a great question that you had, by the way. And, uh, but I kind of want to have maybe the attorney or maybe the auditor or, or I don't know if you can do this, Andre. But um, when we come here and people always talk about fiduciary responsibility, and a lot of times, most people don't understand that that doesn't mean that we uh, don't make investments. Uh, we are actually required to look at how we can invest the uh, agency's money in a, a responsible manner so that there's a return that can come back and be used at future period of time. Uh, an example would be what we're talking about today. Um, of course, a bad or an unlawful fiduciary um, action would be is if you uh, had us invest in your brother-in-law's, you know, company, and uh, there's going to be a conflict of interest, things of that nature. So I, I just kind of want to put that in perspective. Is that the reason why most agencies do that is because it is part of the fiduciary responsibility to uh, make sure that investments are made for an agency uh, on behalf of the people and to uh, for future um, endeavors. So is anybody you wanna... able to speak to that? Is Go that ahead. correct or am I incorrect? You're certainly correct, uh, Mayor Minto. And as, uh, as Andre uh, shared with you, the board does have a fiduciary responsibility with regard to this. And what that means broadly is putting someone else's interest above your own. It's the highest standard of responsibility that you have. So while you come into all these meetings and you, you read the materials, um, when we deal with the issuance of bonds and we have investors who are relying upon assertions that are made in that, this is why we come to you twice. Um, to make sure that you can make the most informed decision that you can. And when you make that decision, you will have reviewed all of the information, not just at a meeting, but really in advance, have explained to you twice. And part of the fiduciary responsibility is a conflict of interest. But I'll say that you have a conflict, a responsibility to avoid conflicts of interest with everything you do. This rises even above that to make sure that you have made a fully informed decision. Ultimately, when we walk through the documents next week, 
You will have had the opportunity to review those on your own, but we will then walk you through individually every one of those documents, point out what you should point, what you should pay special special attention to, and we will indicate to you those uh, those things and what you can rely upon as it, with us as staff having reviewed those documents where you can rely upon us, upon the experts that we have hired on your behalf um, in order to ultimately have a, have a piece that you understand this and you believe it is in the agency's best interest. Thank you. And I just wanna remind folks, right? Um, I think all of you as a local elected officials have a lot of exposure to bonds and, and uh, the fiduciary component of being uh, managing, you know, budget, budgets as council members, as an elected official. But I think there's no shame in being able to have an individual meeting with Andre and say, I want to be able to review where our, where our resources go. And then I think what the independent auditor offices has done is uh, made recommendations about systems and process as well. And so I think, um, it's not only the two times that you hear from staff, but it's also our responsibility if not understanding something to make that appointment. I know everybody's super busy, but to really understand the uh, in-depth um, you know, process of budgets and, and where this money is being invested and how things are happening. So I would say that, did you have another comment? Um, I, I appreciate Mayor Mento's follow-up comment and question. And what it, brings up is perhaps there's an opportunity here for us as a board to understand, you know, what are the bond series that are out there? Um, for example, has the 2008 been completely spent? Or as Mayor Minto suggested, has part of it been set aside in an investment? You know, how do these flows happen? I, I'm sure you have very complicated spreadsheets that have every detail of this, but it would be I think useful to the board for us to really have a sense of this, especially given how many of us are fairly new on the board. We're happy to ask the team to uh, follow up with, with that and share information with everyone. If there's no other further, do you have, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, and I did speak with the independent auditor, Mary, uh, recently, and she helped to drive home the point that uh, an important part of the duties of this board is to assess risk and so I want to ask um, Andre and uh, or Peter to address the issue of risk. It seems clear that we are lowering our risk in terms of uh, the debt obligations with these instruments that you're, we're talking about here. Can you confirm that, please? Yes, certainly I can confirm that. I think, um, you know, we, first of all, uh, on a quarterly basis, we bring a mar market update, usually it's on consent. Certainly we can discuss it um, at a um, more um, in-depth if you'd like to. But we always say in that report that the swaps are, intend are working as intended, which they have since 2008. But there's a lot of mechanics that go into those swaps, including the fact that they're going to be switching to a new index. So as well as they have worked, eliminating them is going to completely take any other risks off because once you fix out a variable rate bond and the swaps are gone, there really isn't any more risk anymore. So whatever potential risks that are out there with our swaps will no longer be there. So your comment is correct. Thank you so much for that uh, thorough discussion. Uh, this was a discussion item only and no action required, but I think we have a couple of follow-up items um, as a result of that. So thank you everyone for, for um, your discussion. Uh, the next uh, item up is our 2025 Regional Plan Workshop Part 2. Before I, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to public comment and then we'll, we'll move forward uh, with how this process is gonna work. Our first public commenter will be Jesse Schmidt with the office of Senator Padilla. Good morning, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and uh, members of the board. On behalf of State Senator Steve Padilla, I stand before you today to respectfully request that SANDAG seriously considers elevating the cross-border trolley project as a priority project in the 2025 regional transportation uh, plan. The CBT project would serve the dynamic regional transportation needs of over 100,000 American citizens 
and U.S. permanent residents that cross the border daily to get to their U.S. destination for school, work, or other place of business. The CBT has received formal commitment from the City of Tijuana and State of Baja California, Mexico, to continue project development. Both state and local governments have already appointed a project liaison to facilitate cross-border coordination. Moreover, the concept has been adopted as part of official municipal and state government planning documents in Mexico. SANDAG can demonstrate its commitment to project development by making the CBT a priority project in the RTP. In order to make this CBT concept a reality, the it will take the entire Cali Your Baja time has region. Expired. Thank you. Our next speaker, Alan C, will be followed by Truth. It would be great to see the presentation first before we can comment. So I guess I'll focus on what I can kind of decipher what you're going to talk about. Chula Vista right now has a bus strike. Great, great, great job, people. It's a you're, you're disabling people. Let me talk about the bus. Two thirds of the bus uh, transport, MTS, is funded by the taxpayers. This is your own report from 2020. You won't release a current report that shows what it is. I got a pie chart, $19.6 million, $61.2 million, transit $44.2 million, $5.2 million. I'm just quoting up all these different uh, where you're pulling the taxes from of us taxpayers, and yet only one third uh, the bus funds is funded by the taxpayer, or funded by the, the riders. If MTS was a private business, it would be an automatic bailout fail. And yet you have these riders down in Chula Vista being suffering right now because the unions that you hugged is actually want more money out of its taxpayers. We have suffered through COVID. How about taking care of the people? I yield Thank back. you. Your time expired. Our next speaker is Truth, who will be followed by the final three commenters. Lauren Cazares, Karina Contreras, and Casa EJ. Truth, please go ahead. Okay, sure. A road usage charge no longer included in the regional plan means that Sendai can bring back a road tax, right? All right, this 2025 regional plan will cost $1.2 billion plus 164 more billion to be magically raised to control our freedom of mobility. Side admits that Sendak must develop a regional plan that meets federal mandates and GHG reduction targets set by CARB. It's really the federal government's plan, along with CARB's dictates, where Nora also works. Conflict of interest. I know you disagree. And what do they want? Stack and packs with managed toll lanes everywhere. But free transit. Do you guys realize that MTS wants more people to pay, not less? Good luck with that. And $29,000 was wasted on outreach because only about 10 people max even comment here. This regional plan envisions a Rockefeller resilient cities inspired, sustainably socialist and resiliently regressive future with a transportation network that is equitably inconvenient, unreliable, unsafe, and best of all, expensive. So I have to say no to Sandag's zero life vision. And hey, Bill, did you know that my mother is a Wells fan now? Thank you, your time expired. Our next speaker, Lauren Cazares, will be followed by Karina Contreras. Lauren, please go ahead. Good morning. On behalf of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, I'm speaking for a variety of industries, small, medium, and large employers in our region. We are proud to support the Cross-Border Trolley Project as a regional priority to enhance cross-border mobility. The project will benefit communities on both sides of the border. Our region is home to one of the busiest land ports of entry in the world. Nearly 58,000 people cross the border to work each day. In fact, the San Ysidro port of entry alone processes up to 70,000 passenger vehicles and 25,000 pedestrians each day. However, border wait times continue to be an important challenge with passenger vehicles um, waiting up to four hours. A Sandag report showed that these waves cost our national region almost $2 billion in lost economic output every year, and it directly impacts over 80,000 jobs. Congestion at our borders also hurts border communities by increasing air pollution and affecting quality of life. Bold and innovative projects like the cross-border trolley are vital to boost and strengthen our region's economy and quality of life by improving regional connectivity and reducing G. Thank you. Your time expired. Our next speaker is Karina Contreras, who will be followed by the final speaker, Casa EJ. Karina, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Karina Contreras. I'm in my capacity as transportation policy advocate for Climate Action Campaign, where we believe that a more equitable built environment will improve the quality of life for all residents in the San Diego region. 
Sandag's vision states, the regional plan envisions a sustainable and resilient future for our region and economy supported by a transportation network that is convenient, equitable, healthy, and safe. Convenient needs to mean more frequency. Equitable needs to mean eliminating transit deserts. Equitable needs to mean implementing complete bus stops in communities of concern and creating an accessible transportation network for all and all abilities. Healthy needs to mean focusing on historically structurally excluded communities who bear the brunt of air pollution. Healthy needs to mean committing to a zero carbon transportation network. Safe needs to mean achieving vision zero, eliminating severe injuries and fatalities for pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you very much. Our final speaker, Casa EJ, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Alejandro Amador with Casa Familiar. Uh, sorry, I thought I heard items 3 to 12 on the last one. It was 3 to 10. But anyway, um, again, I want to elevate the priorities of the border region. We really want to see air quality being addressed and the shift in transportation culture in San Diego, uh, especially in the South Bay and border region. Uh, we want to elevate um, the, the Purple Line, the Blue Line Express, and the cross-border trolley project and make sure that all these investments are as well inviting to people. Um, we need efficiency in the system as well as uh, inviting um, people to actually take the trolley and, and public transit. Um, thank you. Thank you, that concludes the public commerce. Thank you, and uh, there is no official presentation. The presentation that we have in front of us, um, the discussion that we're gonna have right now, and I'm really grateful for Twer, Twer, Tuary. I'm sorry, Tuary. Yes. Okay, I say, I got it right. Yes. Uh, Tuary is. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit more about how we're going to move on to the next room so that we can have this actual workshop and we can roll up our sleeves and have a conversation about this. Uh, so that and and. Um, the presentation and laying of the groundwork, all of that was done at our previous meeting so that we can make sure that we reminded everyone what the fundamentals of the regional plan were gonna be and, um, and really um, have the first discussion last time. So today, what we're doing is we're getting to work and we're gonna have real conversations about where this is going. And so there's, um, I'm gonna turn it over to her right now, but I wanna make sure that um, everybody knows that when we're in the other room, we're gonna do a lot of the thumbs up, thumbs down, right? So the end of the goal for today is gonna to find on what are the things that we agree on so that we can actually direct the team on what the 2025th regional plan development is going to look like as we move forward. And so, just so that we can begin with this process and and you know i want to make sure everybody has input um you know there's going to be things that we're going to agree to disagree on and and that's okay right and then i'm going to ask everyone to put on their regional hats on uh and i understand that in the end we all represent our respective districts and or um councils or entities but i think I just want to remind folks that here we are as members of 18 cities and uh, the, the unincorporated areas, the tribal communities. And so it's really important that we really look at it from, from that perspective and what it's going to look like of what we want uh, the county of San Diego to look like as we're moving forward uh, in partnership with the city. So with that, I'll turn it over to Colleen and then but just, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you, and you have the hardest job of everything because, you know, you're going to try to organize all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Cher, and good morning, board members. Uh, again, my name is Tuari Faola, and I manage Sandex Sustainable Communities team, so I'm excited this morning to be here to talk to you about the second part of our regional plan workshop. So uh, just a, a little bit of a recap, the last time we were before you at your last meeting, we kind of laid the foundation, as the chair said, on what are the fundamentals of a regional plan, the requirements, and we also provided you a high-level schedule. I know there was a, a request to have a little bit of a deeper understanding of what the plan's uh, work plan is, and so that was included as an attachment to your staff report. 
So something else that I wanted to highlight before we jump into some of the requirements and questions for clarification that we requested at the last meeting was uh, about some of the things that we've actually accomplished to date. To get to this point to where we are now, which is a really big and exciting year for SANDAG as it uh, we start to develop the plan, we had to do a lot of foundational work um, updating a lot of current data. And so this slide here highlights a lot of those things, but the two things in particular that I want to highlight for you is that you know, we have been working on our regional growth forecast, and there'll be a presentation on that later in this year. But in developing that forecast, we actually started a Series 15 regional forecast task force. And that task force is made up of staff of all of the jurisdictions, uh, the city and the county staff as participating in that and helping us to develop the regional forecast. And they've been having meetings to really talk about this since the fall of last year. The other thing that I'd like to highlight uh, just to kind of show some of the collaboration that we're doing as we're developing this plan is that in February, we held a joint working group uh, with all of Sandak's working groups um, you know, within our agency. And a lot of those working group members are also made up of the cities and the county and your staff participating in that as well as stakeholders. And we had over 120 people attend that workshop. Uh, it was downtown at the library and was really successful. We talked about some of the regional plan fundamentals that you've learned about, as well as our vision and goals and how we um, measure our plan. So to give you a little insights into what's to come and the presentations you can expect and kind of the workshops that we hope to do with the board, because we really want to make sure that we're bringing you along in the process and that you have an opportunity to really weigh in on all of the different aspects of the plan. So this is your, your work plan kind of laid out. And so we're today here to talk about, you know, the fundamentals, but also we're going to talk about the vision goals as part of your exercise later. We'll be coming back uh, next month to really have a workshop diving into equity. So I might breeze through some of the, the um, slides here since I know you'll be getting another presentation on that. But then taking all of that information, and I also want to highlight that we're going to have our first uh, funding discussion, and the funding will be one of many discussions that we'll have with the board. And then we'll come back in the summertime where we'll really dive into the data that we use, how we use that data, and the analysis that takes place in helping us to inform the projects that we select and you know the policies that move forward. And we're going to have a really robust community engagement strategy that will take place over the summer. All of that feedback from you, all of the feedback we get from the community will help us to come back in the fall with an initial concept. I think this is the part where everybody will be really excited about because this is when we bring back the initial concept that has the cost and it has how we can fund the plan. And we'll take all of fall towards the end of the year coming back and refining that with you. So having an iterative process to, to show you what we see as some of the preliminary results and have conversations around how we refine that to get to the end of December, which is when we hope to take the concept that in includes all of your feedback and the community's feedback and give it to our modeling team who will take this and um, put it into our models so that we can understand, are we getting close to meeting all of the targets that the state and the feds have set for us? And then getting to what we call the preferred scenario, which happens in the summer of next year. And then we uh, also can begin our draft environmental impact report. That process takes about a year and then we'll release that draft as long as, um, as well with our regional plan in the spring of 2025, bringing everything back to you by the end of the year for your consideration. So these were three of the major requirements that we highlighted for you at our last board meeting. And I'll just briefly touch on these because we will have a lot more opportunities to kind of dive in and ask questions uh, during the workshop. But this slide here highlights the state and federal requirements that we need to comply with in order to have our regional plan developed and approved. And so some of the questions I believe that were brought up at the last meeting is how do we consider equity and what are some, how do we define uh, disadvantaged communities? And so in the regional plan, when we're looking at social equity and, and defining equity, we're looking primarily at three uh, populations and that is looking at people of color, uh, those with low income households, as well as our senior population. The federal government requires us to consider people of color and low income um, populations, but you know, back when we were developing our 2015 plan uh, through outreach and engagement, it was um, desired that we include the senior population as one of those social equity populations. And so we do also include the senior population. And you can see the map here on your left kind of highlights uh, the concentrations of where they're at throughout the county. 
And then the other thing that we use in terms of helping us to identify disadvantaged communities is we use a tool called Cal Screen, And this helps us to identify areas in the region where there are low income households, but also these are regions that are disproportionately burdened by multiple sources of pollution. And so the map you see here on the right, uh, the colors that are highlighted in red and orange, those are the areas that are what we consider to be the most vulnerable. So they are the most impacted when it comes to pollution. Uh, and we really want to make sure that we're thinking about projects that help to, you know, target providing um, multimodal transportation, really improving the environmental health and their quality of life. So quickly on uh, air quality conformity, this slide also highlights uh, some of the questions and I hopefully can address some of the questions around how we must demonstrate that our regional plan is meeting the uh, federal air quality standards per, per the Federal Clean Air Act. And one of the unfortunate things is that the San Diego region is uh, considered a non-attainment area for ozone. And so what that really means is that our air quality is um, it's worse than what national standards are. So because we have that designation as a region, our staff has to have consultation with uh, several different state agencies and federal agencies to really talk about how we're going to be improving and not worsening uh, our air quality. And so we have to consult with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Transportation, California Air Resources Board, as well as the San Diego County Air Pollution Control District. So quite a lot of agencies that we coordinate with, all to make sure that our plan is going to be able to demonstrate that we're not worsening or creating new air quality violations. And we have to um, prove that by the years that you see listed here on this slide on the, under the third bullet. And then the next uh, major requirement that we have that I, I know there's always a lot of robust discussion around SB Senate Bill 375 and our sustainable community strategy. And so there were a couple questions about what CARB considers when they're evaluating the plan, whether uh, VMT has to be a proxy for GHG. And this slide kind of highlights for you um, really what we have to do in terms of that and that CARB looks at a lot of different um, indicators and in helping us to determine whether or not we're going to meet that target and they track us in the end to, to know that. So the last slide that I will touch on is just I think will be helpful for you going into your exercise. You know, this is uh, going to show how we achieved our GHD target for the amended 2021 plan. And, you know, it's really important to note as I click through this that as I highlight the different things, it's really about the combination of everything working together. It's not one single strategy alone that we do that meets this uh, GHD target. So one of the things we get to take into consideration is all of the existing projects that are built um, by 2025. So Midcoast Trolley, uh, South Bay Rapid, we get to consider those projects and that gets us around 9%. And then when you look at all of the things that we're planning for, this is the combination of things that we do. And so you can see that it's not one single strategy that's giving us a huge amount of GHG increase. It's really all of them working collabor uh, collaboratively together. So you can't just have one without the other. So with that, that concludes that portion of my presentation. And I'll turn it over to the chair uh, to let me know when you're ready for us to go through the exercise instructions. We're ready. Okay, perfect. Look at the, everybody's faces. They're super excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Grab some coffee, a Diet Coke or something. Yes. We need your brains. Okay. So for your group activity uh, that we're going to be doing over actually in conference room uh, seven, this will probably feel pretty familiar to some of you if you participated in the uh, board retreats, you know, regional plan puzzle. So we're really going to be focused on identifying projects and policies that support the different uh, major requirements that I listed through. But one of the key things is that we're going to be focused on those projects projects that could be operational within 10 years. You know, 2035, this is, we're planning for our 2025 plan. That's only 10 years out. So we really need to be thinking about what are those projects in the early years that we want to achieve that hit that 19% um, reduction target. So the rules of the game, you don't need to take notes. You don't need to worry uh, or snap a picture. We're going to have this for you at your stations when you're there. And we also have staff who'll be sitting with you to help step you through this exercise. But essentially, you're going to have 10 minutes. And what we're going to have are blue stickies that are uh, correlate to projects. And then we're going to have yellow stickies that correlate to supportive policies. You need to pair those together. And you need to make 10 pairs of those within that 10 minute um, time frame. We're asking that you really put on, you know, and I think the chair said this, your regional hat and think about opportunities to provide that hopefully throughout the region, if you can, uh, at least thinking of a strategy in each of the jurisdictions. And then we also allow for a red strategy. Red strategies um, 
Well, let me first say the blue and the, the yellow strategies are those that we think can be operational within the 10 years, but they're also the ones that decrease VMT and GHG. If you would like to add a red strategy, those are the projects that increase GHG and VMT, you would need to add four additional more blue and yellows. And again, we'll explain this to you again when you get to your table, so if it's not very clear right now. And then some of the policies and uh, strategies that you'll see when you get to your stations are really focused on those things that can be operational in the short term. So it's pricing policies and strategies. This can be parking pricing, managed lane concepts, infill development, especially as the jurisdictions, all of the work that you do towards focusing growth, new growth in, um, in infill areas, and then really thinking about where you might want to see flexible fleets or any of our rapid transit. So. This concludes my um, instructions to it. Again, we'll we'll have this up on the slide in the other room and you'll have staff at each of your stations to go there. This is how we have um, broken up all of our representatives. We have representatives to hopefully to be spread throughout each of the four groups. And our planning managers here are going to kind of help lead you to making sure you know which station to go to. And they'll be at the station with you answering questions. We have Keith Greer here who has station four, Rachel Kennedy has station two, Jennifer Williamson with station three, and Daniel Coachman with station one. So if Chair, if you would like, they can please follow our um, planning managers yes. and they'll guide them to their stations in conference room seven. I, I'm just gonna go, gonna go out of, um, Vice Mayor, do you have a question? I did, I had a question. <laughs> you caught me a little bit off guard. I just wanted to make a comment, Ms. Um, Fayola. I, I really appreciate the report that you presented to us on the agenda uh, as part of our agenda packet. I appreciate very much that you included or your team included all of the state and federal um, guidelines. You have referenced them. So, we, you know, Sandag is not coming up with these things on our own. It, we have to follow these mandates. So, so I absolutely wanted to thank you for that. Um, my second comment had to do with um, earlier in your presentation, you were referring to um, involving the public in all of this and there being a robust program for public outreach and what I want um, what I wish to um, suggest to you is during that public outreach that it is a uh, hundred percent crystal clear to the public the intent of what we are planning um, the specifically what I'm referring to is the timeline so um, you know everything in government is slow and I think we all sort of recognize that but I think the public sort of has an idea about that, but perhaps they don't realize why. Um, one of the reasons is because we have boards of many people that come together to make these decisions. We are mandated for when we get together and, and how we talk to each other. Um, as well, the use of monies that is accumulated from taxpayers. We have to have uh, documented clearly the use of these monies we have to revise it revisit it um all of that and that takes time so for during the public outreach portion of our next regional trend uh, regional transportation plan for 2025 i would like for the public to truly understand why it takes so long why it is so expensive um and that their input given now will be implemented in 2025 when the plan is um, adopted and then uh, implemented further in the actual projects 10 years after that. This is gonna take some time. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, May, Vice Mayor, I think uh, it's a really important point. We're gonna head over to a conference room seven, but I wanna just make sure that everybody understands that. Yes, ma'am. I have my hand up this time. Okay, go ahead. Okay, say, sorry, thank you. Um, and part of the, you said that there was public um, comment on, on this and it was held downtown. So as a North County resident, I'd like to respectfully request that you expand. So I actually, that's what I was gonna say, that yeah. there's actually a whole list and in, in the timeline on how many community meetings we're gonna have. I would like to encourage you as uh, local elected officials to actually have either town halls or conversations with your communities so that you can provide that feedback back. I don't think we have to do things the way that we've always done it before. I know I've changed things around a little at the county, right, Joel, supervisor, we've done that. Uh, so I think that that there's a lot of, you know, you can use MailChimp or I don't even know what they're called, the <laughs> surveys and all that good stuff. So um, that's what I was gonna mention, uh, council member, that there is going to be very thorough community input. And so when we are right now doing the conversation about the regional plan, feel free to make those recommendations because I think that this is the moment 
so that if we need to expand anything in terms of the timeline, anything else that we need, we can, this is the time to have that conversation. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, so. No, thank you very much, Chair. Okay. All right, everybody go to conference room number seven. Uh, just two, two quick uh, questions. Um, what are the current uh, CARB guidelines in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions we have to reduce or VMT we have to reduce um, uh, that they just passed last November? I think you're talking about the CARB scoping plan. Yes. And right now the plan has not resulted in recommendations to us at the MPO level. Yeah. I, I understand that, but I'm just wondering, do you recall what that is? I don't or have maybe, the numbers maybe off Colleen the can. Yeah, so I think, why don't we get to the technical answer? And um, well, at the as a follow-up though, I think the the, the, <clears throat> the amount is 25% VMT reduction by 2030, and CARB is likely to enact that and, and put that to the MPOs in between now and, and, the, and the next uh, RTP. Um, is it okay? Uh, I know we're going to work with 19%, I'm fine with that, but is it okay if our teams want to excel and do better with our current numbers and reach the I think I'm gonna answer that question and the answer is you can recommend whatever you want and then in the end it's gonna be up and down or no, we can't have that right now or we're gonna, I, I think that's what we're gonna go have this discussion so that we're not having it here so that we're, everybody gets to talk to each other and you have to convince your teams that that's what they should be doing. How about that? I know you don't like my answer, but it's okay. All right, conference room number seven. Uh, look at your name and look at your group and let's get it done. Thank you. And we'll be back in 30 minutes, all right?
Um, Everyone's there. Okay. Hold on, Jacob. Hold on. This is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So I really appreciate everybody's enthusiasm. We've got to do the, the second part. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh, so the okay. second part is really just to allow you guys to have a lot of opportunity to discuss and uh, talk. And I know our chair is going to help lead you through some of the things that you can agree on. We're going to be taking notes on that. But the one thing we just wanted to let you know before you go into the exercise, and I hope you all really had a lot of fun doing this. And I will say us as the planners have a lot of fun like practicing it ourselves. Did everyone get to, did anyone get to all your 10? Everyone get a 10? Woo! Yeah. Yeah. We got 14. We got 14. We got 14. We got if Jack was on our team, we'll have had 18. We have been hearing as we're going through this process. We want to make sure that you know we're hearing from you, you're hearing from across the region. And this slide just highlights a couple of the things that we know we need to take into consideration as we move forward with the 2025 plan. It's been abundantly made clear that we need to find an alternative to our usage charge. We, this exercise today is really talking about how can we find projects that we can put in place now, not the ones that are in 30 years. So we really want you to focus on what can be operational in the 10-year time frame. And then we know that we need to deliver on our transmit commitments and that the projects and policies that we put in our region, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And safety, equity, climate crisis, all of those things are very important for us to keep things moving along in our region. So this is just some of the things that we have Talk heard and that we've heard from you, we've heard from the public, and we just wanted to highlight it here that we are listening and we're taking that into consideration as we're developing the 2025 plan. And then the thing that you guys are going to do in terms of, oh, the light up, it's okay. um, we, as I mentioned, we had a, a great working group session with our tribal working group, as well as we had one with all of Sandag's working groups who normally meet here uh, at different times through the month. We brought them all together to have one session. And the things that we talked about were our vision and goals. And so they really gave us a lot of feedback and input on what they wanted to see our vision and goals change from the 2021 plan moving forward into the 2025. You'll see one of the things that's different. Last time, just as a reminder, our goals were really focused on a fast, fair, and clean transportation system. This time, we have changed it with some different terminology and wording. But the one thing that you'll see new and different is that we have safe highlighted. And this is really to elevate the board's commitment to vision zero resolution that was taken. A lot of our jurisdictions gave us feedback that they felt uh, fast was in conflict with safety. And so they really wanted us to make sure that we're recognizing that as part of our plan development. And then instead of just saying that, it's really about the fact that people just want a convenient and reliable transportation system. It's not about it being fast, it's about it being convenient for them and reliable because that's what will have them use that no matter which mode of transportation they're taking. And then obviously equity is something that we always keep at the forefront of everything we do. And then really uh, understand that we're looking at a healthy environment as well as healthy communities for the people who live in it. So our board chair, I'll turn it back over to her and I think she's gonna lead you guys in your, through your discussion. Thank you. Everybody to know that I was a complete minority of my people. Okay, so here's the deal. What we're going to do today is, I think we just, like I mentioned before, we're trying to agree on like what are the things that come up or down on some of these issues. First of all, it's a good job of putting this together. I know we had a certain amount of time to think about it and be kind of like a rapid response uh, to the priorities and, and trying to be built consensus. So that's always a tough thing to do, right? Um, but I think everybody did it well. We've heard about the vision and what the goals are that are in front of us. And so what we're going to do now is, is be able to uh, make sure that everybody remembers. Everybody was at the retreat here? Who wasn't at the retreat? Oh, yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I was going to ask that that was totally inappropriate. But anyway, so um, I think it's important that we have a discussion and, and remember. So for those that were not at the retreat, what we're doing is thumbs up or thumbs down or like just like eh, I don't know how I feel about it, and then the majority will be uh, we're going to be there. So I think it's um, like I said, in the end goal is to make sure that the eighteen cities and the uh, county and uh, as a whole has an ability to really have a regional plan that has access and ways for people to get to work and grocery stores, and and we talked about that in our in our group as well. So we want to make sure everybody's spending less time in their cars, but understanding the distance between our communities and our areas as well. So as we go through this discussion, again, consider where the area of consensus may be. 
remember our posts and um, um, are okay, and that things can be intentional, and, and both of them are important. So um, if we listen to folks and talk about the either or thinking and challenge each other to reframe how we do this, I think it's really important. And then we also want to do the uh, statements in an affirmative way so that we can focus on what we can do with rather than what we can't do. And so this is only the beginning of many discussions that we're going to be having uh, on the regional plan. And like I said, we want to make sure, and I'm just going to ask you the question again in a minute, but we want to make sure that we are looking at what the opportunities are, how we align them, and take it from there. And then um, I'm also going to start uh, start us off with a set of three general statements and ask staff to help capture some of those statements so that when we work through this, um, so it, and you're good? You're right? Okay. So it's important that we capture the importance of board and community input, and uh, because that's the way that everything starts. So the first statement is: Is it important for everybody here that the 2025th regional plan be based on board and community input? Is that what we're About the nose, or I don't know. Or I just don't want to participate. Yeah. Um, so I think it was the majority of the thumbs were up from those people that are able to participate in vote. So I appreciate that. Is it uh, important that it addresses the mobility needs of all of our communities today and in the future? Thumbs up or down? Uh, yeah. Is it important that it addresses the mobility needs of all of our communities today and in the future? Is this a way to thumb? Does my vote count? <laughs> Is it important that it needs state and federal mandates, including PhD charter? So we have coming for the people who said no or or did they say, uh, do you mind talking a little bit about that? Because if it's Oh, so I just want to I want to make sure I emphasize what the actual language is because it says that we need state and federal mandates, right, including the AHP target. So if we don't, I want you to give me the reason why we wouldn't and how will we address it. So just want to hear some of those comments. And if you don't want to share, that's okay. Too. So maybe. Well, for me, the reason why I would say no is because I think that um, these mandates are created by people who have an agenda and aren't really looking at the true science behind it. And, um, and so that's why I would say no. I think it's too, uh, too specific to an agenda. How would you alter the statement? Say what? How would you alter the statement? I don't remember that. So how would make it positive? How would you make a, that statement? It's important that we meet state and federal guidelines, including GHG. You didn't agree with that. So what in that line would you agree with? How would you alter that statement so you can get to a neutral or a thumbs up? I would say that we uh, do not comply with any state. <laughs> I don't think that's the direction they were looking for. <laughs> I want to have this conversation because I think that compliance... like that no, 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 that's why I asked it, right? Because I think it's important to have this discussion, right? So, so when you make rules as the mayor or council members, and I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to say it generally, right? And you and you make those rules, um, then are we telling communities that they can get to choose what they? Uh, Agree on and what they don't agree on, they don't have to do, right? So I'm just putting it out there because I think that's really important, right? We may not like what the majority of the legislature is is doing, and that's why we have um, discussions and opinions and all that. But there are laws, and there's ways to change the law, right? If we don't like it, um, which is why I ran for office because I didn't think the county was being run uh, in the best interest of my community for the last 25 years. So I ran for office, and I'm changing everything. Um, so. That's that's why we do what we do. So I just want to put that out there and so that we can have that conversation. Uh, council member and then supervisor and then yeah. So I, I really want to push this notion of vehicle hours traveled, reducing vehicle the time in the vehicle as opposed to the vehicle miles traveled. And the reason I'm a sideways is I know we have to meet the mandates in order to get our funding. However, to really push. We've got this phenomenal data science group here. And if we can calculate reductions in vehicle hours traveled, 
in parallel with the other calculations we're doing, maybe we can provide some data to the state to push shifting how the greenhouse gas reductions are calculated. I can buy that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's what I was going to suggest, but she said it already. <laughs> you brought up a good point, Chair. And one of the things I think the discussion absolutely needs is the benefits of compliance and the con consequences of non compliance. What do we stand to gain? What do we stand to lose if we don't? So, the idea about local laws and rules, we all know what the penalties are for those. But what are the penalties for non compliance? Is it you're not available to get grants? But what are those grants fund? Do they fund more compliance with the rules? So then if you know what, what you stand to lose as a result of non-compliance, you know, maybe it's a push and you say, fine, we're good with that. But can't be saying no, I don't know from now. Yeah, but maybe it's a region as a whole no. Yeah, yeah, if I may, I, I think that you're asking an important question, and I have some very good points. But here is something for the forget sunlight. Let us say that we decide not to comply. And that's easy, that they'll do it, right? But your city. And the county, you can't really move forward because every time you do something that involves the state fuel reporting, you have to have an approved regional plan. So, like this discussion about bonding, and when you have the obligation to understand it, this you have to understand that non compliance doesn't just impact when you put on the state money from the standards, but in fact, the state is using your own city. You can't do it without the compliance. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying agree or disagree with the, with the laws, but these are the laws. If, unless you change it, like Council Member Fisher said, why don't we change them and team up with other reasons? Unless you change them, non compliance is really going to harm your city. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I agree, and I, I think we all understand that. I think what we disagree with the fact that is um, that's more of a totalitarian mm -hmm. form of government right. because they're saying, do what we tell you or you're punished. And um, and that's I think what is the biggest rub for me, you know, get it done. But there's a lot of things we could do to reduce I think these uh, gear greenhouse gas emissions, you know, and and keeping people out of their car for so long, get them to move faster on the freeways is a great way of doing that. And uh, if they would help us do that, then you know it'd be easier to comply. Yeah, and I think the thing to remember, and this is what I keep reminding myself, especially as somebody who serves on CARB, right, is that there are laws and mandates that have been created, and the transition, we are in the transition. And I think we need to remember that, that we are in the transition from getting from where we used to be to where we want to go. So, so like, I'm the kid who grew up in both worlds, right? I'm 51, so I grew up in the never having an iPhone, and now I have an iPhone. So the younger generations don't even know what it's like to live in a world without like ruling everything and whatever. I had to go to the library and get a, and actually, you know, book. Well, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and look it up. Right? So, and so I think we are in a position in terms of these laws and trying to make sure like we're fighting for clean air. And so, you know, people get really emotional because if I think about the number of people who have died or are sick in my community, and not just in the South Bay, in San Marcos and Escondido, and some of these communities that haven't had those regulations that have impacted so bad, I would say, hell no, let's fight this because I want to make sure that people can breathe and the people, you know, the fleets that are standing in my in the in the border for hours, those are like, those are killing the kids in the schools. So it's a tough emotional conversation to have. But I think it's it's how do we meet those goals because we want people to be able to live in our communities and then it shouldn't matter because right now if you live in communities like La Jolla or in communities north of the eight, you have a better chance of having a good quality of life with good health. And I'm not thinking what I'm saying is that those other facts, right? Talk about science, the data is there. However, there's pockets of areas in North County where you do have um, injustices in terms of breathing and access to air and et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do that as a region to think about what does this look like as we're moving forward? And so for me, it's like, I saw the majority of the folks say, let's comply. But I think that's important to have that discussion about the, the no, I don't want to comply. Or maybe is there a way to get you all, some of you to this space where we're able to say, we are, I don't particularly agree with it, but I understand that it has to be done. And I'm going to work on trying to figure out how to change this so that we can be practical about the implementation of the law. I mean, I think that's how I would look at it because the implementation of laws is, I think, the most difficult thing that we as local governments have. 
And all these folks in the federal and state government come up with these grandiose ideas that are like, let's do it, let's change it. And then I'm like, okay, but how do we do that right now? Because we don't have any money or resources and you know all that good stuff. So anyway, I would just say that. Nora, <laughs> maybe, nor, maybe if we added a, a proactive component, not just to stay within the lines that they're providing, but also push back with additional things that better suit our community. You know, one of the challenges that we had at the state level was we invested $3 billion in the infrastructure of our water, and yet the governor wouldn't allow us to use the water when no other community invested. And so maybe if we get out ahead of it, I don't know if, John, if that gets you there to a neutral position, but at least we're complying so we're not losing time, but at the same time, we're offering a better solution and a better representation of our communities. I like that. So maybe if we were to add to that phrase um, and use the influence of SAMDAG to adjust the metrics to better suit our community, our region. Do people like that? Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Can you explain that? And use the influence of SAMDAG to alter the metrics to better serve San Diego region. Okay. You okay with that, Jack? Yeah. Okay. How do people feel about adding that? Thumbs up, down. Okay. All right. I see a majority, and I want to be mindful of time. Um, are the people who are like just not participating? Is that just just like there's no way you're ever going to move on this item, and that's okay? Yes, sir. If we're going to make restrictions like that or considerations, how does that play in Sacramento? Because they tend to cookie cutter the rules. Well, I mean, we're doing it with the RENA and stuff now, right? We're having discussions. We we put people pushed enough on RENA. That's a perfect example of how people pushed enough that now you're having ARENA 2.0 and there's discussion across the state. And I mean, I know that at CSAC, California State Association of Counties, we're having that conversation about what the impact is on rural, rural suburban, and urban areas and what the impact is. And we're having the conversations on VMT, we're having the conversations on everything. So I think that's the power of being a local representative that even it crosses party lines when you're trying to address some of these issues and you can use statewide entities and other, other you know, systems to be moving forward. Yeah. Just very quickly to, to build on that. The direction that you're giving us today, you're giving to our staff to draft a plan for you all. Our job then is to bring that to you and help you understand what the trade-offs are. Here's how close we got to meeting the laws or not. So just keep in mind, this will be refined before we actually submit something to the state. But this is your first step in guidance for the staff to develop a plan for you. And the plan could be very specific to making sure that we use standards yes. input to ensure that we're addressing, you know, the, the, the language that you use really so that local entities um, are really not interested. And the, it's a regional perspective. And I think that's the beauty of standard, right? I mean, you can really look at it from a different lens as well. So how do people feel about moving moving on from this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. And for those of you who are just can't get moved on this, I think that it's perfectly fine. It's your prerogative. But I think it's important to really think about your role from a regional perspective and what that looks like as we're moving forward and how uh, we can provide any feedback on how we make it work. Because I think um, I think that's the biggest job we have, right? How to get it done. So, all right. Thank you, everyone, for your discussion, and and um, this was really really good. I was just thinking, we as a we spent a lot of time on this. It's a big a big deal what we're doing, um, and I think in our exercise. You know, we recognize the heat map or whatever word you want to use to call that map. And we put the resources there because that's what we needed, right? I'm asking for one thing. Everybody can probably guess what it is for Carlsbad. And then we put a lot of resources around that. The point is we all want to reduce greenhouse gases. We all want to be able to reduce vehicle hours traveled. We all want what's best for the environment. And if we can work together and show that we in solidarity can support each other to that end, I think it is is verbiage like that, that we do the mandate, you know, we follow the mandate. That's not necessarily needed. I love that, what you said, lean in on Sandak's influence and that we're standing up for our region of what we actually need and not the umbrella approach 
uh, from Sacramento that he mentioned. So I think that it's important that we are recognizing we are on the same page for so many different things. I think you were here. I was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna, I have one more statement and then I'm going to um, hear from folks. Who the other one is, it is important that it, we, it advances equity and economic prosperity, including in the unincorporated areas of the county. What do you think about that one? Uh, and and Anderson? Anderson? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you feel about that? <clears throat> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> well, I think uh, that's why I voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for me, I think it means we, we've done. I think Sandek has been very intentional about, for instance, having a social equity uh, committee that really looks at where our underserved populations are, where the community infrastructure inequities exist. And so as we're planning and moving forward, we're thinking about the region as a whole and where those needs are. So like, if you look at our plan, I kept saying, right, it's not just about, you know, the bus, like in my perfect world, we wouldn't have these fast buses. Who wants that? But because I would like to have one of those big like trolleys, and I think I talked to our port folks about this, right? That you have like an actual trolley that goes from one place to another that is super fast, like the way they do it in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, other areas. So we don't have the funding for that right now. So you have to have bus, let's talk about, you know, all the way to Temecula, right? People are living in Temecula and working in downtown San Diego. How do we get them on a fast bus it just takes them, you know, extra fast and, and you get them out there. So you're looking at jobs, you're looking at, um, you know, economic um, situations, you're looking at how do we get people to where they need to be. And, and that's to me what um, equity and economic prosperity looks like. Is there anything else that I'm missing? Well, I have a follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. How do we make that happen when we don't run the bus service, MTS runs the mm -hmm. bus service? Like, for instance, in Santee, they eliminated, we have a fight to have one bus that goes around our city. Yeah. And we know that we need people that need to get places in Santee, students need to get to school, and we know that also that with all those cars sitting on the freeway in the valley, it creates a huge greenhouse gas effect there and it makes it unsafe and unhealthy. Yeah. MTS at the time, Robert Delay, doesn't care whether or not that happens in Santee, but they do care if it does happen, for instance, near the border. Yeah. And we even talked about that a little bit. So how do we well, get that, that group to to um to buy into the same philosophy that we're going to get to if we're talking about equity. So I, 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 what I would say to that, and I don't have all the answers to be real. Um, I would say well, that, that out there no, no, to everybody. Yeah, can talk and about. and you know, what I would say is that what we did, for instance, a good example of this is the the funding for uh, no cost transportation eighteen and under. Right, people have been fighting for that for decades. Um, and we were able to say, I said, okay, I'm going to put this amount of money from the county. And then Sandex said, we're going to put this amount of money from the county. And then we were able to get, I mean, from the from Sandex with, with your all of your recommendations and approval. And then MTS said, okay, we're going to do it too. And we're going to expand it to foster youth. And we're going to do this. So we're all actually talking to each other, which is, I think, a very unique new way that we're doing work um, in the county of San Diego. It, had, it wasn't happening before. I think entities were just not talking to each other and they're like, this is our lady, this is what we do, this is what you do. And, and I think North Transit, I heard from the mayor, right, about some stuff that was happening in, in uh, North County where, and I've met with some of the folks in North County and they said to me, right, there's sort of like no communication happening with folks. And I think we're trying to shift that. And by having all of you participate in this is how we're doing it, but go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to add, add along those lines. I think we need to recognize we can't fix all of it here, and that we we hold multiple roles, right? And so I told Ron at MTS that he raised a similar issue. I have no interest in leaving Santee behind. If, if you tell me you want bus service in Santee, I can go back to MTS and work with Ron to make that happen. Until that's articulated, though, what and this is what I told him: the South Bay and, and urban San Diego is very vocal about wanting those services, and so it, you know we we want it. We say we want it. He's here to provide. You say it, I'm all in. Right? And then it becomes something that we can advocate for funding here, and I advocate for operationalizing over there. And I think that all of this becomes easier if we recognize that we can't solve every problem or identify every solution in this room right here we can do some of it and then we all have our jobs to do in the other entities that we serve on as well 
And I think I think with the equity, I'm sorry, but I think with the equity and uh, prosperity, and, and as we are getting community input, um, I would say if this is a value that we have, right, that we want to make sure, then I think that's something that we present and we advocate for, and then we move forward. And you know, I'm an organizer; that's where I come from, so I think it needs to be done. Yeah, I, I think it's important for you to know that the role that created and NCTD and MPS were very clear about what agency does what, which agency does what. Standard, you do the planning, the clearance, the design, and the building. And once you're done, you turn it over to transit agency to run. So you, as the board of Standard, has an, actually the law said you have to plan for the region. So it's not the transit agency. You can't blame the transit agency for not having the right line for somebody and can blame your star because that's what you do. Secondly, I will just tell you from experiences elsewhere, and I think you as regional leaders need to think about this. Santiago is 3.3 million people. It has three agencies that all of them think they're doing planning and, and two of them run, run, run transit. And I would say, is there a need for three agencies to do that? Or is there is a need for a metro agency that has all of those components that coordinate with each other so you don't have, and, and you know, there's a lot of arrangements about saying, I think you should think about what's there. I mean, if LA of 10 million people have a metro agency that gets billions of dollars more because they're one agency, they operate and they're on transit, uh, why shouldn't San Diego 3.3 million people think about that? But clearly, the laws right now say you plan, you build, they operate. And that gives you the right to figure out which lines goes away. Yeah, I've been talking about that since before you got here. <laughs> and, uh, I remember when I said that the first time about getting rid of MTS, NTC, and just having it here. I remember Paul Jablonski sitting in the audience and about to pass out. <laughs> we're, not getting, we're not getting rid of anybody. We're saying, <laughs> There should be a metro agency that does all these activities in a coordination. But uh, I'm for that. before I move it on to all of those, did that answer your question about sort of what advancing equity and economic? It was a kind of given example. Right. Well, I, I think I understood it, but I wanted to make sure that I heard it. Okay. Right. Let me get the mayor first. Yeah, I think that the uh, explanation we got from Hassan is, is uh, we need a more clarity on that, more discussion on that, because MTS and, and NCTD have a board that has fiduciary responsibilities just the same as this agency does. And it's more complicated by the way transportation agencies are funded. Yeah. So you you can't sit here at Sandag and plan things and expect these transit agencies just to carry them out because they have an obligation to do their provide their services in ways that make you know, that spend money correctly by federal transportation laws and, and uh, you know, response to the needs of their community. So um, I think we need a little more clarity on what we just yeah. said. And I, I would add, because I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of, of talking about the infrastructure and sort of that, because that, that's not what the discussion in front of us is. It's really, is it, I, I need to get a sense from you if, Advancing equity and economic prosperity, including in, in unincorporated areas, is a priority for you or not in this regional plan. That was the question. And then we went into it because we were trying to give examples. I want to bring everybody back to that particular question. So, ask you again is that your comment? Well, I have, I'll add two things. First one is we've talked in our board about identifying transportation deserts, the places within the county that just don't have buses or whatever it is that we need. And related to that is priorities, getting kids to school and having children have access. It's fine for a bus to be free, but the bus has to be there. So somehow we need for a mechanism where when we recognize here a transportation desert that NCTD or MTS, we've got two representatives here, are able to fill in the blanks, the gaps. Yeah, I'm a member of So here's, That's I think what you're saying is exactly what advanced equity and economic prosperity is about mm -hmm. and in the unincorporated areas, because I think 
what I, I'm hoping staff is hearing from mm -hmm. the board and, and the discussion is that, yes, this is a, a powerful statement for us, but it's super broad. So as you're, as you're actually creating the bullets under that and what that looks like and getting feedback from the community and board members individually, because I, I would hope that people will go back and think about this as, as this process is moving forward. There, that's what there's a timeline. And this is right now what we're doing is creating the framework for how they're going to move forward. And then you'll have things like we need to look at what the transportation deserts are so we can prioritize our budget uh, allocations. And we need to look at within those transportation deserts, we need to look at what it looks like for our kids trying to get from point A to point B and our seniors, right? That's another big one. So um, so with that, if there's no further discussion, can I go ahead and ask you again for thumbs up or down? Or yeah, a thumbs up, can I? Just yeah. make, I think the broad statements that you're making is what we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Quite often we come up with an answer uh, before our planners and innovative planners can come up with a, a better solution. So fixed bus routes, fixed uh, bus schedules, there's probably not going to work well in Tanti, but a bunch of other stuff, flexible fees would. And so to me, what we should be asking for is not projects, but broad goals like equity, like serving all the areas needs, right? And and let the experts say, what's the easiest but cost effective way to provide that. Yeah. And provide, uh, uh, but, but I will say, uh, council member, that I think it's important in addition to the experts, I think our voices and community voices. I don't, I don't, I don't, I know that you're not saying no, but I just want to emphasize that that's really important that the community voices and that the board member voices are included with the experts because I think sometimes, uh, that's where the rubber may be We want to make sure that we're doing it in such a way that, sure. and, and we can prioritize, yeah, 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 and what we want to put forward. So, if we want to put um, getting rid of the uh, transportation deserts is a high priority. We could put that in the, uh, cool. on the list. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's okay with, with me. But, but I hope we work on this broader uh, goal uh, and rather than what we think is the solution. It would have may have been a solution 20 years ago, but it's not the solution, best solution today. Yeah. All right. I think that one looks good. We're going to move forward. How about minimizing burden to taxpayers and maximizing affordability? How do you feel about that? Yeah. Say it again, please. It's it sounded too good. It, <laughs> <laughs> sounded too good. I want to make sure I heard that. <laughs> so minimize burden to taxpayers and maximize affordability. Yeah, good. All right. Um, coordinating with local jurisdictions on standing land use assumptions. Yeah. Okay, you say it again. <laughs> Coordinate with local jurisdictions on land use assumptions. Oh, yes, please. Okay. And the mm -hmm. high thumbs up. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 So, support each jurisdiction's diverse housing goals. One more time, please. Support each jurisdiction's diverse housing goals. I think that's really connected to like the ring up. Way far off. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm going to take responsibility first and create this initiative first. It actually ended up being easier for us to do the planning. All right. How do you say that for a thumbs up and down? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we commit to, uh, you know, each re representative commits to taking responsibility for fulfilling SANDAG goals within our municipality. I don't know who wants to help me with this. That we look to build consensus in our municipalities toward the SANDAG goals. Well, right. equitably. So, you know, because not every jurisdiction needs the same solution. Right. Right. So, I mean, there goes that equity thing again, which yeah. I think is super important. You know, Chair, we already have SANDAG broken up into our constituent regions in the North County, the Coastal South Bay Central. And it's already organized that way. So if there were maybe subcommittees, I ever want to organize it. So oh, that, I like that. Then we could get together and say, you know, what, what South Bay needs is not necessarily what, yeah. what Poway or the region needs. But we can then come together and say, this is what we need to establish the standard in our part of the region. I really love that. So maybe what we do, because you all need another meeting in your life. Uh, <laughs> what we could do is, uh, so what's really important about this exercise that we did, it's not just we're doing this exercise and it's just going somewhere and nobody's going to look at it. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to uh, put all of them together and create themes from it. And so I think it would be really cool as you're dividing them up by uh, sub-regions, and then we're able to present it before it even comes back to us again, present it to your point to sub-regions, sub-regions have a conversation together, because sometimes even the sub-regions may not agree on what the priorities are for them, but um, agreeing on that, having a, a thumbs up on where we're at, like, how do we prioritize that? And then... How do we prioritize the overall sort of projects and initiatives that people put together? Yes, sir. Something I brought up a while back is looking at our subregions. Remember we talked about this? Because especially with the redistricting yeah. and the different leadership you know, in different areas. Um, uh -oh. uh, no. Clean up on aisle four, please. Yeah, it's a big um <laughs> maybe, maybe the uh the, the subregions, for instance. Uh, South Bay uh, in North County and on whatever may not be exactly the way it should be today. Yeah. Uh, maybe it should be different now because, like for instance, Santee and, and Poway are now you know more in, in a different district, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, Lemon Grove, La Mesa is in a different district. Um, and not that I'm trying to get rid of you guys. <laughs> I'm just saying maybe we should look at that because it's not a bad oh, thought. Yeah, the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So perhaps that's, that's something we can bring back. I know. So Ms. Coronado and my district. Rather than I guess <laughs> I was going to add that we have the corridors and group a lot of planning going on in the corridors. Yeah. Uh, and the corridors, I think, may be another way. To, I just don't want to let you you know create more layers of another uh, group. Not that I don't like my people in, in East County. I think that's great. I'll work with everyone in East County, but if we're dealing with transportation, that was the idea that Santa came up with. Let's deal with the whole corridor. Um, and those meetings are already scheduled, and I hope we to support that and, and carry that conversation. And we're I, I just think it's, it's time to, to look at this thing. I think that regardless of what the lines are with the different subregions, there's the spirit of the idea that each region has opportunities to take on you know projects and policies to mitigate um you know infrastructure challenges so that we're all carrying a little bit of the brunt of the burden i just wanted to make sure and caution that because i'm sitting next to jack i learned so much about the needs of south um, in the South, right? And how they vary wildly from what we have up North. So if we create these subregion groups, we still have to be sensitive to the entire region. So I just don't want that piece to be left out. Yeah, no, no, that is, that's why I said, I, don't, I know you want all one another well, meeting, but that's what I was talking about. Yeah, and I think, I mean, just as we advocate for regions or have those conversations within our subregions, it doesn't mean that we will kind of also everything else that's happening, but it's the coming together and the collaboration at that point after we've all taken a little bit of the weight of what needs to get done for act, for the actual overall improvement, um, that then, then we can go on into the conversation of what is it that we can do collectively. Yeah, and I think it also gives us an opportunity, like if I'm thinking about that, and I think we have pretty good communication in South County, but 
uh, it allows us to also fight for additional dollars because I think in the end, like you can have every fine that you want, but implementation without resources, and it's not worth anything, right? You can dream big and it's amazing, but you need money. You need money to be able to put this stuff to work for our communities because even when you're saying to them, oh, this is a plan for 2025, 2028, whenever it is, like, yeah, but how do I get from point A to point B right now? That's my problem, right? So I think we have sort of that tension that we have to address. Uh, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, to change the subject just a little bit, there are four red squares, one on each oh, of okay, us. Before you change the subject, let me go ahead and make sure that we have somehow captured some of the information that Council Member Melendez brought forth because I think is really important. And I think it's sort of this conversation about inclusion and then, you know, sort of seeing it from that lens, but at the same time looking at the bigger picture. And then in addition to that is looking at corridors and other other planning opportunities so that we can including we're including that. And I think to the council member's point is really understanding that we have a responsibility to be aware of what the other issues are. You know, I mean, I think that Supervisor Anderson and I have the privilege of representing 3.3 million people, right? Because we are the county. So even though I represent District 1, 670,000 people, 650,000 people, um, it, it's still everything I'm doing, every policy, we look at it from a big picture perspective because it's our job to do that every day. But I think it's really important that all of us, right, as we're looking at the port, as we're looking at the airport, what do all these different entities mean to the work that we're trying to do to move people from one place to another? So I think we're all on the same page. Everybody good with that? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. I think every one of the four landed on the same red, and that is Highway 78 needs some attention. That that's pretty remarkable that they're independent groups Thank landed you. unanimously that's because they all have one person in each of the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't coincidence. Let's just say that. So, uh, so yes. So. I don't know if you're finished with, with the list, but I have a, a, a kind of broader uh, goal for the uh, regional plan, which is to reduce health impacts um, in where, where the, the, the most severe. And and um, I learned uh, not long ago that San Marcos, Carlsbad, Coronado has some of the most uh, you know, polluted uh, these are particulate matter uh, maps. If you look at the Cal environmental map, uh, I mean. Coronado actually is in the 98th percentile uh, of some of the worst air when it comes to diesel particulate matter. So I think it's a very inclusive uh, goal if we say that we want to reduce uh, health impacts in the next regional plan in, in some of the areas with the highest amount of pollution. Um, it does not um, exclude, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, North County, Inland County, and even actually uh, unincorporated areas of the county. Uh, some of those uh, sensitive tracks have some of the worst air pollution in, in, in the county. And if we could pay some attention to that in the next plan, I think it'd be great. If we do so, we will finally be planning for less pollution rather than simply mitigating for it. Well, and the other piece of using the healthcare index is that um, you can get money for that, right? We were able to use funding. I mean, we were able to divide up our funding on ARPA based on the healthcare index and make sure that. Um, you know, there's this assumption it's always been needed in South Bay, but actually the assumption that the concept was wrong. There were need that there were pockets of areas like Lemon Grove. Um, well, I don't know that Lemon Grove is still South Bay, but, uh, so there was Escondido, uh, San Marco. Some of the areas had pockets that really needed additional funding that would have never happened if you were looking at sort of disproportionate uh, historical access versus actual the data. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate Council Member Shu's comment. I think if we put the language in the next um, T uh, TRP that we are looking to improve the health of folks that have been so very impacted versus saying we need to reduce, reduce GHG because there are certain characterizations around the, those terms, right? Yeah. Sadly, GHG means something to some people. Uh, vehicle miles traveled means something to somebody else. But I think if we are actually focusing on the fact that we are wishing to improve the health of people, I think that absolutely that characterizes these aims a little bit differently for people. I think, you know, perhaps everybody does understand, okay, yeah, 
you know, greenhouse gases does cause, you know, bad air for people and this and that. But if we're actually not focusing on that, but we're focusing on the health aspect, I think some people will understand it at its core, uh, perhaps a little bit better. How do people feel about that? Thumbs up? Yeah. I don't know if I have a uh, where are people in the middle? <laughs> Let me, can we do it again? Because I, I feel like people like I know we're, I know this has been a really long meeting, but I do think there's some more to help on the <laughs> So it's it's really considering healthcare impacts uh in in uh, the regional plan as we're looking at you know and, and I health impacts health, 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 what did I say? Health healthcare. Oh sorry, health. Health. no, that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's health, health impacts. So and using there's data that you can use for that. Uh, yeah, and I mean, for me, it's like they're kind of doing three jokes, but the three things that you said that Jack said that we said here were all different to me. So it, it yes, I agree with it, but it's what are the our metrics are being used, right? Is it the unhealthiest communities or is it the area where the unhealthiest conditions exist? You can't exclude one completely in the expense of the other. You need to look where you know if the air is really bad here. But there's you know more you know worse life expectancy yeah. in your healthcare here. We can't only focus where that is and leave the worst air in place. Yeah. So I that, think it's that's both. all I wanted to say because I kind of heard two two or three different things. Yeah. yeah. I think we're all adding to each other. But yeah. And, and some of those conditions are not necessarily organic to that location. The forcing needs to be addressed. Yeah. Okay. So we're good. I think yeah. everybody with that we can move yeah. forward. Then. Is there anything else that people have? Because I know we're at twelve fifteen and we still have a big item. That we think we need to go look at. So the next step for this is that we're creating a framework for what we want in this regional plan. There's still community input. There's still a lot more work that all of you uh, hopefully are going to do by providing input to staff, things that you want to see, uh, questions that you may have. Um, and there's a whole time. I don't know if you have a copy of the timeline in here, um, but it would be just a reminder that this is only the like the first step for the framework that we're creating. Uh, the team will come back, they'll provide more information, community input, and all of these items are going to be sort of put together so there's uh, actual um, themes around it, right? I just take these 20 seconds. We really appreciate your time from this kind of format. And we're planning this for all the key elements of the plan, including how you fund the plan. We know that's super important to this group as well. So we want you to sit at these tables and have that discussion. So we truly, the team here really appreciates this because this gives us marketing order to bring a plan to you. Right? Everybody good? Yeah. 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 Okay. So why don't we take five minutes so that we can have a break and then back again. Thank you, everybody.
Okay. All right, everyone. I want to make sure that we um, give the folks. Um, thank you again for your participation and for all your work. I know that we are we are um, on a time crunch here, but I want to make sure that um, we give an opportunity. This is um, item number thirteen. And it's our final report for today. It's part two of the contracts audit. Um, Ms. Mary is going to start with her presentation. I've asked her to shorten the presentation. You have should have all received um, background information from her, and I know she's contacted some of us already. And so, uh, and then we're going to have Ray also do the same um, and uh, talk about management response. And then we're opening it up for discussion. But I'm going to turn it over to Chair Cito. And I just want to say. I mean, everybody needs to give this man kudos because he has just done so much work on this particular, he's been the chair of audit and he had been doing it for a while. And then I called him and I said, can you do it one more year? Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair Stato, for all of your work. Thank you. um, and uh, we, him and I talk a lot. And uh, even though I have a crazy schedule, he's really always willing to talk to me in weird, weird times. So uh, <laughs> late or very early. So I appreciate that. And so I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, and please, I'm sorry, feel free to grab food so that you can, you know, cause I know it's already late. Thank you. Yes, I don't want any hangry board members. Yes. Um, but, so yeah, thanks. We're here to talk about the second part of the contracts audit. Uh, this was a substantial and challenging effort. And on behalf of the audit committee, I'd like to thank the OIPA staff on their hard work and diligence in completing the audit. As, uh, audit. It's been a long road. Whoops. I'd also like to uh, thank Sandag staff and management on their efforts in responding to the audit and drafting the management action strategy. You'll note I use the term strategy because we are still in the process of creating the plan, which there are more dates and TBDs to be figured out. But, but um, like with part one, due to the what I would consider misuse of some of the audit reports that has occurred in the press, I would ask that we keep a couple of items in mind as this report is discussed. First, the knowledge that everyone here involved is here to work towards the betterment of this agency. Auditing, auditing is by nature a contentious process, but OIP and management are clearly doing their best to make progress towards a more effective and efficient agency. And two, let's make sure when we bring up issues that we keep the comments factual. Uh, try to avoid statements that start with statements like one could believe or one might assume just because they can lead to things that may not be quite true. So let's keep to the facts. As I noticed, this was a challenging audit. And while there is not complete complete agreement on all aspects, the audit committee felt that the most important aspect is where we go from here and the next steps to be taken. And these areas are aligned. Given this, the urgency of creating a common vision is in moving ahead. We felt it was important to bring this forward. There will be many more discussions in the audit committee as we fill out the action plan, and I look forward to tackling those soon. We will keep the board updated and informed as we move forward to implementing the recommendations. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mary to do the OIPA presentation and uh, and thank you. And then I also wanna make sure that I emphasize this. I wanna say thank you to Mary. I had a conversation with her this week um, in terms of some you know the regular questions that they ask, but I think it's really important to remember that the Office of Independent Performance Auditor is something new for Sandag, right? And so um, it's a tough place to be in when you're having to uh, do uh, a lot of internal restructuring and or recommendations and modifying a culture and what that looks like. And so I appreciate that um, her and Hassan have a good working relationship and are able to really think about the big picture and how to move things forward. So thank you, uh, Ms. Mary, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Zito. Um, we'll try to be really uh, quick on this because I know everybody's uh, ready to call it a day. Uh, it's, it's a rather lengthy presentation, so we've reduced it by removing uh, management's response and auditor's response, uh, though they are included in, in your packet. So if you have any additional questions or you want some deeper dive or details, please contact me after the meeting, and I'm happy to sit with you and go through those findings individually. Um, we typically when we submitted this to the audit committee, our presentation included allowing for time for questions after each finding. However, we're not gonna have that kind of time today. So my recommendation is, is take notes on the slides that you might have questions and you have two options. You can ask them after the presentation or you can even contact me and we can have a further discussion where we have more time to sit and talk about it. So with that being said, I'll start the presentation. The scope of this audit was uh, 
around contracts and procurement, the operations, the full operations of that. The time period was from July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2021. Keep in mind that there were contracts that started before and that exceeded that 2021. However, what our focus was, was on the active contracts during that period. The objective of the engagement was to audit Sandag's management of contracts and procurement. And we took a two, uh, part approach because it was such a large task. Part one, you've already seen those results and it consists of auditing the system controls and operations to ensure that there were effective and efficient controls. And we, you've noted those findings and we're working with management to uh, on the corrective action plan as well. Part two consisted of reviewing Sandex contracts to ensure the contracts are being adhered to, including but not limited to ensuring the incurred costs have been accurately invoiced and documented properly prior to remittance. We also assess the ability for SANDAG to properly obtain and store adequate records, including but not limited to verifying the process and controls and that they were adhering to policies and procedures. So our initial intent of part two of the review was for the auditors to perform tests and procedures of several of the contracts that were identified in part one in those tables. And it was those tables that identified the larger percentages of amendments. Some of them were up to 700%. Um, however, we faced limitations. Uh, we encountered file disorganization, inconsistent placement, or completely missing documents. Um, things could be due to the system System that's in place could be manipulated or changed after the fact. Um, so there's no control in place that prevents uh, a contract once it's initiated from having all the documentations that led up to that negotiation and that contract from being manipulated. We also identified hundreds of task orders and amendments that were either unorganized, missing, or you couldn't locate it in the file that they designated as their file of record. As a result, we went ahead and selected three of those major higher risk contracts from part one, um, which led, of course, to looking at hundreds of transactions and documents. In addition to that, we selected an additional 12 contracts to perform substantive testing over invoicing payments. So to put this in a little bit of perspective, um, there were over 3,000 contracts during that period. However, there were only of that 3,614 vendors, and of those 600. 14 vendors, there were about 75% that had less than three contracts. So we felt that we took the, the highest risk that were both the riskiest due to the number of amendments and the percentage change, as well as the dollar value. So we do feel that we selected enough that is the representation of the population. So the ability for auditors to test for procurement fraud screams, such as bid rigging, price fixing, on the contractor's side of the, the house was limited and really unfeasible as a result of having so much information that was just missing or disorganized. So we encountered or identified several matters of concern inclusive of the following matters that required further investigation. Um, uh, Moving on to the next fiscal year, we have included some of those um, contractors to be reviewed in, in depth around invoicing and supporting documentation. Um, so we were a lack of resources and time. We could not pursue that. Matters limited to or non-existent records, matters due to inconsistency and unreliability of data and documentation made available to the auditors, matters due to the disorganization of files made it very extremely difficult to auditors to navigate in somewhat of a timely manner, and matters due to records and information that was restricted by Sandag management. Not all Sandag management, but we did have some restrictions, and I think we've since worked those out. Um, and they clearly understand that AB 805 provides that auditors should have unrestricted, unlimited access to information, including employee information. So what we came up with is eight major findings. Finding one, please bear with us because um, it's got some sub findings to it. And the reason we really had to keep it collective and together is because it's very relevant to one another. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Crystal, who will discuss finding one and two with you. Hi, everyone. So finding one was non-compliance with procurement laws, rules, regulations, and internal policies and processes. 
uh, auditors reviewed two solicitations, three contracts, 61 task orders, and 137 amendments. The two solicitations that were reviewed had a combined capacity of $379.5 million and awarded contracts to uh, several vendors that were listed in part one of the audit. Uh, the three contracts that were reviewed were for vendors XZ and AA, again, identified in part one of the audit. The review of each procurement transaction required us looking at the uh, executed document as well as the approval package. Additionally, auditors had to determine if open competition was required and or board approval was required and locate documents uh, to confirm that that did actually occur. And so there were nine sub findings under this finding and they'll be addressed individually. So sub finding one is individual evaluation score sheets and notes for solicitations were missing or insufficient. So during the review of two solicitations, auditors identified that the individual panel score sheets for the shortlist and interview phases were missing from the digital records. Auditors only located a combined matrix that had the combined notes and scores. And those documents are combined by the contract staff. Auditors later located in the hard copy records, some of the individual score sheets and notes. And for one of the solicitations, some of the hard copy score sheets were still missing. For both of the solicitations, notes were either minimal or non-existent. An example of that is for one of the solicitations and one of the shortlists within that solicitation, there should have been 105 forms in the of the individual individual panel member score sheets. Uh, one form was missing, 57 forms had no notes at all, and 13 forms uh, had minimal notes. So there were only about 30 that were actually fully complete. The OIPA recommends staff create a standard procedure and updating the forms to for procurement solicitation evaluation per panel participants to follow that would explain their responsibility to complete the score sheets and provide notes that justify those scores and to create a procedure and provide training to the contract staff for that solicitation process. Sub finding two is contracts and task orders were not fully and openly competed and were also not documented as sole source procurement transactions, which conflicts with Sandeg's equity and DBE commitments. So auditors identified 36 out of 46, which is 78% of the task orders that required competition were not properly competed. The task orders did also did not uh, have the sole source justification documents that were required. Additionally, there were two limited competition task orders that also did not have the required documentation. Uh, during part one of the audit, auditors had identified that Sandag failed to compete contracts fully and openly. Uh, during this part, part two, auditors identified one contract where full and open competition was required, uh, but was sole source instead, thereby failing to ensure Sandag's equity and DBE commitments are being met. The OIPA recommends that staff update the board policies to clearly explain competition requirements for contracts and task orders, and that they clearly explain the options for not competing and the procedures required for that. And ensuring that the procedures around procurements clearly explain the need and requirements for competition, as well as when exceptions are allowed. Subfinding three is contract and task order amendments exceeded $100,000 without board approval. Auditors identified 44 out of 122 task order amendments that did not receive the required board approval um, for exceeding the $100,000 combined amendment threshold. Additionally, there was one task order amendment that was valued at $99,999. Auditors identified a documented conversation where contract staff advised the project manager of a 25% amendment limit. However, auditors could not confirm that that amendment limit uh, was documented in any policy or procedure. The recommendations for this sub-finding were updating the procurement board policies to clearly limit the amendment amounts. Uh, allowed without both the executive director's signature and to specify when board approval is required for amendments and updating the board policies to clearly state when the amendment amount requiring board approval, uh, requiring that it's a cumulative of all amendments and that it should consider any work that's been done for the exact same project under a different contract or task order unless full and open competition has occurred since then. Updating the procurement manual to reflect both recommendation one and two and creating a procedure for contract staff that clearly explains their role in reviewing amendments and ensuring bid splitting and avoidance of competition is not happening. 
Subfinding four is contracts, task orders, and amendments were retroactive. During the review, auditors identified 17 out of 201 transactions that had been retroactively dated. Sandag considered these contracts, task orders, or amendments effective prior to the procurement transaction being executed. Executed is defined as when all parties have signed, just for clarity. Um, amendments were retroactively dated to authorize changes after the contract and task order had already expired, making them invalid when considering their execution date. The recommendations for this subfinding include updating the board policies to address retroactive procurements and to clearly restrict or limit them, uh, creating an, a tracking system or method for expiring contracts and task orders to ensure customer department awareness of planning needs, updating the procurement manual to follow recommendation one, as well as to limit um, the approval of retroactive requests if negligence occurred by, on the department's behalf, and create a procedure for departments and contract staff to explain their roles, responsibilities, and requirements around retroactive requests. Contracts department uh, to provide training on appropriate planning efforts and expectation from project managers and departments. Subfinding five is contracts, task orders, and amendments were missing approval documents. So during the review of 201 transactions, auditors identified that the following approval documents were missing. So 13 transactions were missing the requisition form, 14 transactions were missing the independent cost estimate, 76 transactions were missing the record of negotiation, 67 transactions were missing the cost analysis. The OIPA recommends that staff update the procurement manual to clearly explain the required forms for procurement transactions, create a procedure for staff on requiring forms from departments or project managers, and how to review them for completeness and compliance. Subfinding six is contracts, task orders, and amendments were missing signatures. Auditors identified eight out of 201 transactions on executed documents that were missing the required Office of the General Counsel signature where the scope of work uh, was changed. The OIPA recommends that staff update board policy 17 and the employee handbook to create more internal controls to clearly to include clearly limited parameters around procurements uh, by including the OGC in all transactions to ensure risks are mitigated. Subfinding seven is inadequate justification for contract and task order amendments. During the review of 137 amendments, auditors noted that the amendment justifications were either lacking, repetitive of the amendment title, or included one of the following reasons as justification. No cost time extension, continuation of services, or delays in project. The OIPA recommends that staff require uh, staff to provide detailed reasons and justification for amendment requests and create procedures and provide training to project managers and contract analysts to ensure amendments are reduced in frequency. Subfinding A is missing task order records. Auditors identified eight out of 61 task orders that were missing from both Sandag SharePoint record system and the contract management system. So the uh, in part one of the audit, if anyone hasn't reviewed that, we explained deficiencies around the CMS system um, in that audit. Uh, the OIPA recommends staff create procedures and provide training for contract staff to, to address proper document storing and recording procurement transactions and to create a procedure for quality assurance and quality control efforts to ensure that storage is, is happening properly. Subfinding nine, contract has conflicting contract dates with no clear explanation of applicability. So during the review of a vendor AA contract, again, vendor AA was identified in part one of the audit, auditors identified three different contract dates and they were listed in three different areas of the contract and did not clearly state when one or the other applies. So that was effective dates, period of performance and ordering period. So the OIPA recommends that staff update the contract templates to define the various dates specified in the contract, update the templates to ensure consistency when referring to those dates and clarify when each date applies, and then updating the templates to ensure that they explicitly define if task order terms are allowed to exceed the contract expiration date. Finding two is high awards and increases due to non-competed procurements and excessive amendments. 
Vendor Z was originally awarded $25 million for one of the on-call contracts. The total contract amount increased to $128 million, which is 412% higher than that original award. The original solicitation was advertised for a combined amount of $260 million that was meant to be shared amongst various on-call vendors. So this means that Vendor Z was awarded 48% of the original solicitation amount that was advertised, again, expected to be shared amongst all the on-call firms over a seven-year period. So some of the other things the auditors noted in this contract were that there were seven contract amendments, three of which were to increase the contract amount. A total of 38 task order amendments were issued. Four contract amendments were issued between two and eight months after the contract was executed or a previous amendment to the contract was issued. Ten task orders that required an open, uh, open competition were not competitively bid. 14 task order amendments that exceeded $100,000 failed to be brought to the board for the required approval, and there was one additional that was valued at $9,999. 20 task order amendments were issued between two and eight months after the task order was executed or a previous amendment to the same task order was issued. So the recommendations include creating policies and procedures to ensure competition in, is open and full as frequently as required creating policies and procedures to ensure sole sources are limited and thoroughly being reviewed and analyzed to ensure potential risks are mitigated, and creating policies, procedures, and providing training to project managers and analysts to ensure amendments are reduced in frequency. I'm gonna pass it over to Mike to take finding three. Thank you, Crystal. So finding three was that invoices are missing or lacking supporting documentation or not consistent with the corresponding fee schedule. So auditor selected 15 contracts, and as Mary intimated earlier, these contracts came from uh, vendors that were in the table 3.2 as identified in part one of the report and appendix, uh, uh, appendix A in the current report. And of these 15, that includes the three that were reviewed in finding one and two that will be talked about later in finding seven. So auditors judgmentally selected those 15 contracts to review invoices for. Of these contracts, auditors identified the following. 27 digital invoices were missing from the official folder of records, but were listed in the financial system, one so, uh, the financial system's one solution. In those reports, in those total $272,473. 21 digital invoices were found in the official folder of records, but were missing from the One Solution System reports, and those totaled $311,923. Auditors also judgmentally selected 86 invoices, both digital and hard copy, totaling 20, and those 86 totaled $26.6 million, and identified the following. Of the 86 invoices, only 82 invoices were located and had a legible fee schedule to compare to. One cop, uh, one invoice wasn't located and three invoices had no, uh, their fee schedule and the corresponding task order were Ill illegible. And of those 82 invoices that were located, only seven had adequate supporting documentation and were consistent with the corresponding fee schedule. This means that 75 invoices or 92% were unsupported. So the OIPA is recommending that staff require detailed slash itemized invoices and progress reports or detailed summary of work performed for a payment to be processed. Update the procurement, update the request for payment form to explicitly require invoices to be attached. Create formal procedures and trainings for invoice payments to include instructions and methods for verifying work is included in the contract or task order. Update the contract templates to require detailed slash itemized invoices as well as progress reports or detailed summaries of work performed to be included with the invoice. Create a tracking and filing system to ensure that all received and paid invoices are recorded and filed properly. Create a procedure that provides instructions on entering and processing invoices to ensure all info is entered correctly into one solution or or any future financial system, financial payment system. And lastly, to investigate how many invoices were not captured by one solution and determine if financial reports were inaccurate because of that. In finding four is encumbrances are not recorded upon award or execution of a procurement. So auditors uh, observe that staff does not uh, encumber the awarded amount at the time of award or execution of each contract and or subsequent task order or amendment. 
the encumbered amount in the financial system was less than the value of either the contract or the total of all task orders. Government accounting requires that the full contracted amount by fiscal year be encumbered. Encumbering obligations helps to prevent overspending of a contracted amount and is used for real-time budget tracking. So the OAPA is recommending that staff create procedures that clearly identify both the contract and finance department's roles and responsibilities for encumbering, as well as step-by-step -step for instructions for each department, provide regular training to each department on their assigned roles, responsibilities, and procedures, create a streamlined process where both departments are communicating regularly on updates or changes to the encumbrance process and ensuring that their procedures align, and lastly, creating a process and tracking system or method inclusive of both those departments for internal controls to ensure all encumbrances are processed upon execution of a contract task order alignment. Finding five is that weakened internal controls due to excessive delegation of authority granted by the board of directors to staff to govern agency oversight. So when SANDAG, uh, so when SANDAG board policy 17 was amended in 2019, uh, the general counsel removed stipulations that clearly restricted bid splitting, making it easier to manipulate the requirements without board knowledge. Removal of the language from a board policy does not change the requirements to adhere to law, rules, regulations, or best practices. Auditors noted the following examples of non-compliant non procurement actions and transactions which conflict with proper internal controls. Not all, procure, not all procurements that required open competition were properly competed, but instead management opted to ignore written policies and required laws, rules and regulation and often sole sourced. And not all of those sole sources included the required justification documents. Contract and task order amendments were, were authorized without required board approval. Procurements were retroactively dated, missing required approval documents, and some executed documents were missing signatures. Justifications and reasons for amendments were inadequate or missing. And task orders were missing from the record and one contract had conflicting dates with the executed document. So the OAPA is recommending that staff update board policy 17 to clearly restrict bid splitting. Update board policy 17 to limit the executive director's authority on approving agreements to only allow emergencies and or urgent need procurements. And both emergencies and urgent needs should be clearly defined in accordance with the applicable laws and reducing the delegated authority back to 100,000, bringing the balance of governing oversight back to the board. Update the delegation of authority by executive director policy with the recommended changes to board policy 17 and current board policy 41 by creating more internal controls to include clearly limited parameters around contract amendments and task orders by including the ODC and or finance departments in all transactions to ensure risks are mitigated. And lastly, update the procurement manual to restrict and or clearly limit procurement uh, transactions and actions that conflict with proper internal controls to include the examples referenced as observation in this finding. Finding six is retroactive procurements by executive leadership to rectify and pay for unauthorized work. Next slide, please. So auditors noted documented discussions between uh, management that stated that HR had, ex had exceeded the $150,000 capacity under a contract awarded by not issuing required task orders to authorize work. To rectify this, the former director and legal counsel of contracts recommended issuing retroactive task orders. According to the discussion, discussions, HR was unaware of the requirements to issue task orders under an on-call contract. Additionally, contract staff knowingly recommended executing retroactive task orders for work that was already performed but not originally authorized via task orders. And furthermore, auditors obtained document evidence where the former director and legal counsel, counsel of contracts made claims to the effect that retroactive procurements were improperly authorized as well as improper sole sources and public works procurements had occurred. So the OAPA is recommending that staff update the procurement board policies to address retroactive procurement transactions if allowing them clearly limit the allowed circumstances to emergencies. These restrictions should clearly define poor planning, poor, poor planning, specify that it is not allowed, and should include examples such as departments being unaware of expiring uh, contracts or task orders, among other examples. Create a tracking system or method for expiring contracts and task orders to ensure awareness of planning needs for current and, current and future procurements. Update the procurement manual to follow recommendation one of this finding. 
create a procedure for staff to explain the roles, responsibilities, requirements, forms, and appropriate need needed for all procurement transactions, including retroactive procurement requests. Provide training on procurement planning to include appropriate efforts and expectations for project managers to include tracking of contracts, monitoring of expiration dates, and procurement timelines to follow for any next steps or changes to projects. And lastly, to provide training to departments and project managers to ensure understanding of, of on-call contracts and processes to award task orders. I'm gonna hand it over to Chris and he's gonna take findings seven and eight. Thank you, Mike. All right, so finding seven, inefficient monetary amendments of contracts for non-performance. Auditors identified three interrelated well, I contracts. Just, I just wanna, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I mentioned at the beginning that we are short in time and I'm seeing that people are starting to leave. So I just wanna make sure that we are able to- I do this uh, in like five minutes. Okay, yeah. all right, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, auditors identified three interrelated contracts for a project where the overall cost of all three contracts combined increased. Vendor AA was responsible for project management of vendor EE, which included managing the contract schedule and budget, as well as oversight of vendor EE's performance. Task order one for vendor EE that is managed by vendor AA was executed in 2017 and was to be completed in 2019, but has since been extended to the end of 2023 due to vendor EE's failure to perform. Vendor's AA contract is a combination of fixed fee and time and material fee schedules, which allows for the flexibility to amend. Vendor AA's current contract has been amended a total of five times and the previously awarded task order slash contract was amended three times for a total of eight amendments regarding this particular project. Vendor AA was awarded a total of $6.5 million for project management services and has been working on this project for over 10 years. Next slide. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll just move on to finding eight contracts awarded for services that in-house staff should be qualified to perform. During a review of contracts for consulting services, auditors identified 21 human resources contracts totaling $5.6 million and 93 Office of General Counsel contracts totaling $35.4 million. Auditors identified an overlap in the services from contracts that were awarded to consultants and the job duties and qualifications expected from internal staff. After auditors reviewed the HR and OGC staff duty statements, it could not be determined if staff expertise is in line with the job descriptions due to the details within the duty statements sometimes being vague and inconsistent. Auditors could not accurately identify amounts encumbered and or paid for the identified contracts due to Sandex financial system being inconsistent and unreliable. Auditors were also unable to obtain salaries and benefits data from Sandex payroll system due to confidentiality concerns presented by internal staff. Although the IPA and auditors made several attempts to obtain this information in accordance with the AB 805, which grants unlimited and unrestricted access to all records of any type to auditors, there was still an unwillingness and lack of cooperation from some, mem some members of management. And then the uh, full and complete audit report with management's responses been made available to you. I'd like to thank OIPA for the tremendous amount of work that they did over the last year and a half pouring through these contracts and coming up with part one and part two of this audit. These findings are an important tool for management to use in improving our processes and our procedures and strengthening our business practices. I just wanna point out the magnitude of the effort that the team undertook. Sandag processes over a thousand contracts a year. And as Mary pointed out, there are over 3000 contracts that are open at any one time. We have more than a dozen systems of record that we use to maintain all of these uh, contracts. The Midcoast project in and of itself, which is one of the projects that was under scrutiny here, contains 315,779 files, not pages, files, and it takes up 2.4 terabytes of data on our servers. The, um, if, we had, if we took a look at what the boxes that we have in storage right now, we have 2,628 boxes. And if we laid those side by side, it would be over a half a mile worth of boxes that, that we have documents in. Um, were there difficulties locating the records? Absolutely, yes, we agree 100%. There are boxes that are full of hard copies. We have scanned images, electronic files. We have multiple different software systems. Some of these files are over a decade old and anybody would have problems finding them. The lack of an integrated software management system makes it exceedingly difficult for the auditors to do their auditing work effectively. 
and we appreciate the light that OIPA shed on this very complex process. We look at these results from the audit as constructive criticism and that these findings will make us a better agency in the long run. All I can say is that we have a lot of work ahead of us and that Hassan and I, along with the rest of the management team, are committed to making the improvements a reality. Our vision is to build a transparent and easily auditable system. Let's be frank, this was a difficult audit and a difficult audit process. Over the course of the last 18 months, WIPA made hundreds of requests for documents from Sandag staff and we dutifully fulfilled those. And there was no time where we tried to keep any records from OIPA. There was, however, one uh, request that came in in January to have access to some payroll records. Sandag staff did do its best to provide OIPA with access to this information. Uh, without revealing protected personal information such as uh, banking, routing, and account numbers, race and gender, home address, social security numbers, and wage garnishment information. Uh, OIPA indicated they didn't need that information uh, for their investigation, so we tried to provide OIPA with data, but we were unable to give it to them in a format that they could successfully use for analytical purposes. Essentially, we gave them a PDF file. We reached out to our vendor of that system, which is Ceridian, and we contracted with them to write a custom query tool so that OIPA could have access to this system while protecting the personal information. Unfortunately, that effort took seven weeks, and by the time that we had that completed, the auditors had informed us that they had found the information they needed in other uh, documents and files. We now have a tool for OIPA to use anytime that they need to access the, uh, the payroll information, and it now protects that personal information. Notwithstanding that incident, I am pleased that based upon the testing the auditors were able to perform, that they found no indication of intentional wrongdoing or fraud by staff. This agency has been around for 50 years. It started as the comprehensive planning agency when the federal government required the county and the city to get together and coordinate their transportation grant applications because they were overlapping at the time. But over the decades, Sandeg evolved much like a private industry company, and it grew through mergers and acquisitions. What was once a plan coordination organization grew into not only a planning agency, but an agency that builds infrastructure, operates tolling operations, runs the automated regional justice information system, and more. With each one of these acquisitions, we acquired people, we acquired additional processes, overlapping policies, and we acquired hardware and software systems. The agency over the years did its best to integrate all of these acquisitions and the myriad systems, and over the years, we tried to modernize them. But if you fast forward to 2016, what we ended up with was a Frankenstein system, much of it that was homegrown with weak system controls, inadequate checks and balances, insufficient quality assurance and documentation, disjointed records management, and an unnecessarily complex procedures that are all wrapped around an antiquated technology stack. The first real crack in the system was exposed when the transnet forecast error was discovered in late 2016. Externally, that caused a media cycle, loss of credibility in the agency, and in part was responsible for the passage of 805 and the creation of the IPA function. But internally what it did is it led to an extensive root cause analysis to identify what caused the forecast error and a corrective action plan that was undertaken to fix that known as the seven point plan. And I wanna be clear that the need to have an integrated standardized system with robust policies and procedures is not lost on management or our senior staff. Mm -hmm. We have been working through uh, with our agency while um, trying to make these improvements over the course of time. But this was a wake up call for the agency and at the beginning of what became really a culture of continuous improvement. And today we're a completely different agency than we were in 2016. In late 2017, uh, Chair Terry Sinat spearheaded the plan of excellence that broadened the seven point plan to include improvements throughout the entire agency. And that was completed in December of 2018. 15 months later, COVID hit, and in March of 2020, we were forced to move from a system that was paper-based to a format that was electronic-based. Was the transition perfect? No. Are there still improvements to be made? Absolutely. And we are committed to making those happen. 
When we returned in 2021, we put together a framework called the, the Plan of Excellence, and those are the guiding principles going forward that include many of the, many of the processes that are in place today. On April 14th, if you remember, I brought to you items, uh, an, uh, an item outlining the process improvements that we've, we did. We've done over 140 process uh, improvements since, since 2016. And many of those process improvements are, were inspired by OIPA and the audits that, that we've undertaken. Many of the others are in, internally uh, derived and there are many more to, gom, to come. This transition is much more than involved in simply refreshing our people, process, and technology. It's fundamentally rethinking, re-engineering, and ultimately reinventing the way this agency does work. We are committed to the future of improvement. This slide shows some of the things that we've implemented since this audit was done. We created a project management office and hired a PMO manager. We've contracted with UCSD to do project management training and PMI certification for our project managers. We launched a national search for a new director of contracts and procurement services who has experience with, with federal and state grants. We added a new training budget development manager in next year's budget to help with the, the movement forward of all of these processes. And we have our contracts analysts going through 30 hours of FDA training related to federal procurement uh, regulations. We've outlined a comprehensive training program for our contract analysts and project managers. And more importantly, what we did is we mapped OIPA's recommendations into the processes of re-engineering activities that we are doing right now to really strengthen and improve our contracts and procurement functions. This timeline shows how uh, we went about modernizing the technology. We started thinking about it in 2018. I'm going to go really quickly here. Uh, basically in 2019, what happened is that we, we, we went out for an RFP to find a standardized software platform that could replace about 15 different platforms we had internally here. Uh, the RFP had over 2,400 requirements. And, it, and what it was done, what it did is it focused on outcome rather than, than on, on functional steps to get there. At the time, we asked OIPA to review the requirements and the narrative, and OIPA did a full uh, review of it. They gave us suggestions. We took all of their suggestions. We incorporated those into the RFP. And so the system we're implementing right now under this RFP includes those OIPA uh, suggestions. This ERP is going to eliminate a significant amount of, of the systems we, we currently have going, um, that we have in place. Um, the audit report recommendations from the first finding, I just wanted to show you, is, are basically all baked into um, what we are doing right now. And these, this is just a snapshot of what those look like. We have three phases in terms of the ERP implementation. The first phase is the financial management. It should be done in Q1 of 2024. You can see the other two phases and when they're going to be done. These are the systems that are being replaced with each phases, total of 15 systems that are being replaced. And one of the big problems we have, and one of the problems why it's so difficult to find these files is that all of our systems that are currently being used all use different types of backend technology for the storage of the documents. We have everything from SQL 2007 to proprietary databases to Excel sheets, Oracle, and, and we have manual processes throughout the entire thing. The current ERP system flow looks something like this. The current processes are in many cases paper and we use email and scanning to get them through the entire process. Lots of room for error. The new ERP system, the vendor submits through a portal. There is a check in there to make sure that the, in, that the invoices match what the deliverables are, et cetera. And then we confirm and we end up um, paying the, that, those invoices. So the checks are electronic. Here's a timeline showing where we are in the process. And you can see the line that comes down, that's where we're at. We're in the implementation phase for the financials. We're in the design phase for the contracts. The yellow arrows show you the requirements uh, that came from the first and the second audit and during what time period we will be uh, addressing those and creating those SOPs and, and processes. There, it's, it's premature to do them right now because we haven't designed the system yet. Once the system is designed, we will be moving over and, um, and, and implementing all of those. So with that, Chair, I'd like to hand this back over to you, but I do want to offer one final thought, and that although OIPA and management disagree on a lot of the details of the findings in the audit, 
We are in violent agreement as to the path forward and the solutions needed to fix the fundamental problems that we have here um, at Sandag. And furthermore, we are committed to working together to make sure that these improvements are implemented. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I, I do want to thank everyone uh, for doing their part in the audit. And I know it seems like uh, we've gone speeding over this, but we actually have been uh, on this topic for more than 35 minutes. So I want to make sure that we I think we only cut it by like a couple of minutes. I unfortunately have a time certain in Chulavis at 1.30, which I'm going to be late to, but I wanted to make sure that I um, that I share with all of you that I think it's really important and I'm really happy to hear that we've made so many improve, improvements that all of us um, are really, that you all are implementing, that team is implementing, and that the process is moving forward. Um, I understand that there's still a lot of work to be done as we're trying to ensure, and because our, my commitment and our commitment, I think, as a board, I know as a board, is to ensure that um, communities understand that there's transparency, accountability, and that there are systems in place so that as we're modifying, um, we don't have the same challenges uh, moving forward. So I'm, I'm confident that the systems that are putting, being put in place uh, really will ensure the integrity of the work and, and that it's really about the, the people that we serve um, in our communities. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to the chair of transportation. And as I do that, um, I will ask uh, that we go to public comment and then member comment. And again, I have to excuse myself. Otherwise, I would have stayed longer. But unfortunately, it was a commitment that I had from like a long time that I couldn't change. So thank you. I have three public commenters on this item. The first, Alan C. I thank you, Chair, for that next door. That was phenomenal to actually let us see the process. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. I apologize. Th thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing us to see that process next door. Perhaps maybe that's where the board meeting should be because I saw a lot of open dialogue, a lot of communication. You, you looked human. And I, I, I loved I loved that interaction with everybody. That was phenomenal. Uh, the team here, phenomenal to actually show us Again, transparency, phenomenal. All I ask is a member of the taxpayer, uh, treat every contract as you do as a remodel. When I had my kitchen correlation, when I had my kitchen remodeled, just said, you know what? Let's put one more light there, one more there. That was the only cost overrun. Every contract, no matter how long it takes, it's a contract. If they come back and say, you know what? It's going to take us another year, so you owe us another million dollars. No, that's a contract. The only time that cost overrun should happen is if you ask for one more light or one more little cabinet. So please take that into consideration. Treat every job as you do your own kitchen remodel. Granted, it's a bigger kitchen, but that's the way every contract should be because you got to tighten up the budget. Thank you, team. Our next public speaker is Truth, who will be followed by the final commenter, Blair Beekman. All right, this is true that I'm trying not to be hangry. Sandag grew into a Frankenstein, all right. So this auto report has found that Sandag is a billion dollar organization without basic controls and records management. I guess its primary foundation was built for fraud. This report said that, quote, management did impede the auditor's information by refusing to provide unlimited, unrestricted access in accordance with AB 805. Auditors were unable to perform a large percentage of testing for procurement fraud due to numerous missing, unorganized, and, and or unsupported transactions, end quote. So management didn't follow the law, but they want all of you to follow the state and federal mandates for a regional plan. How about that? So I, I'm concerned that this means this whole audit was fraud. Sandag hides even more than declassified FBI files. But here's a short summary of what was found. 78% of contracts and task orders were not openly competed and were also not documented as sole source. 44 exceeded $100,000 without board approval and 170 were missing approval documents. So here's what I think about that, I guess. Thank you, your time expired. Blair Beekman, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, Thanks a lot that you're offering public comment at this late point in the afternoon. Uh, you guys usually don't, and you are today. Thank you. And very much of a thank you to the previous public commenter uh, whose feelings I, I, I feel much the same, that it was really nice just watching and participating in the uh, workshop process. To make that a, a public process uh, was really enlightening. Thank you. 
Um, I hope it was from that workshop process and the really good intentions of these auditing reports that you're doing at this time. It seems like good, really good intentions that uh, you can really consider um, how to uh, incentivize bus drivers uh, to want to continue uh, their routes in the future. Um, they're, they're working with union people right now and, and working with uh, how to address strike issues now. I hope part of all this work is, is that bus drivers will want to always continue their routes and not call in sick in the future. Thanks. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. We'll start taking uh, member comments. We'll start with uh, Vice Mayor Molina. Thank you very much, Council Member Chu. Um, thank you for this information. Uh, you're you're um, sort of speaking my language a little bit. I used to work in biotech for many years, about 14 years, and I worked in a company that produced um, potential medicines. Uh, they were that would eventually go into uh, clinical trials, and so we were subject to FDA audits uh, regularly, and it was. Um, quite the operation. And so I'm hearing uh, missing documentation and, um, you know, other other findings uh, in that regard. And, and you sort of brought me back to that point where I'm like, oh, let's, let's get things done. Um, in my experience, uh, mistakes that were done, there was a procedure for correcting mistakes. Uh, documentations and um, other findings such as training and this and that, um, there were corrective actions. We had CAPAs in place to, uh, to make us better. Uh, quality control and quality assurance were key in that experience for me. And so I absolutely appreciate um, the findings and the recommendations from the audit committee. During your presentation, I know um, in the report, the management responses were included in each of those points. And I started to get a little bit scared because during your report, you weren't mentioning the responses from management. Um, so I'm very glad, uh, Mr. Major, you were able to provide the, the um, responses at the end of the, the whole thing. So. Um, it actually gives me a lot of confidence that we are on the right track. You know, um, the, the these findings are from 2017 through 2021. And um, from what I understand today, from this point forward, we are better already. There is a lot of work to be done, and I, pre I appreciate the work that um, uh, Ray Major and everybody up here is investing in all of this because it is very important, absolutely. So uh, let me just um, mention, um, fundamentally, we are making changes and we are allowing for a corrected sand act. And I, I appreciate that. I, I don't have, um, I don't feel that we're not going in that direction. So thank you for that. Um, and ultimately, um, we are granting stakeholders and most importantly, taxpayers, uh, the ability to rebuild the reputation of this organization, you know, however it was broken in the past, we are now t taking steps to rebuild that. Um, and hopefully in the end to regain that public trust. You know, um, I respect and I invite public comment, but of course it is horrible to hear Standad's name dra you know, dragged through the mud um, based on past practices. So uh, Mary, your team has allowed, um, your work is based on fact, and it will ultimately help us to counter those points of view with facts. Thank you. So we'll go to uh, Del Mar, uh, Councilman Dashlin. Thank you, Chair Shu. <laughs> I guess our interim chair. <laughs> Great. Um, so first, thank you very much to Mary Kushmashrab and the full team, Crystal, Mike, and Chris, for the clear and succinct presentation. And thank you, Ray, um, for, 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 for giving us that background and the insight into under the hood, why was it so hard to find so many of these documents? And uh, so first, everything Lou said, and I won't say it again. Um, one of the things that was said here was that there was disagreement in details of the findings, but agreement overall that, you know, we need to move forward and correct the processes. But the details of the findings were so clearly laid out with numbers of contracts, numbers of invoices and such. I don't understand, and I would like to understand 
how there could be a different point of view on details of the findings. It seems like that's the very place where there should be agreement. When um, you look at the number of files that are missing, for instance, um, we went back after we, we were actually quite alarmed when we heard that there were uh, files missing. We went, we worked with OIPA, they gave us a list of all the files that were missing and we were able to locate a number of those files. Okay. They may have been misplaced, they were in the wrong places, they, they were, uh, the titles were different, the search criteria on the electronic forms needed something different than what you would normally expect because they're difficult to do the electronic searches. And so the OIPA was not able to get to those documents. That's why they're in the findings. And, and that's why I, I, you know, it was very clear that, that we need to do a better job with a more transparent system that allows them to be able to get to these documents. We have a tremendous amount of documents here. And a lot of them are in things like PDFs that are not searchable, for instance. Okay. So when we talk about the details, like we're, we're looking at that type of thing where we're in agreement is that the solution is not to necessarily go back and write a process for something that happened a decade ago, but to look at the new system and make sure that the, the process and procedures are in place to make sure it never happens again, and to make sure that, that it is auditable. And so the audit staff is an integral part of our user acceptance testing. They have time in their budget next year to be part of our testing. And so what they're going to do is, is, is as we roll this plan out, they're going to be they're going to be running the type of scripts and reports that they need in order to do complete audits. My hope is that they're going to be able to do audits whenever they want to. I'd love it if every contract that goes out, they push the button and they audit it for us and we know that it's perfect. But that's what we're striving for. And I think that's where we're in complete agreement is we need to fix this stuff, right? I think when you get down to the details, it's like, it, it, that's where it becomes like, well, okay, if, we, if we're gonna go through a half a mile's worth of boxes to find these things, you know, I guess we can do it, but it doesn't seem like it's the best place to put our efforts. Yeah, that's actually a great vision, the idea of an effectively an automated audit report so that it can then be reviewed. Um, so two, more follow-up questions. So finding number three, um, in, in finding number three was that 92% of invoices had insufficient supporting documentation. So this goes to what um, Council Member Molina, Deputy Mayor Molina um, pointed out. Um, so for that 92%, is it what you described that it's, there's documentation, it's just, it's in this morass of paper that needs to be searched, or was the documentation simply never there? Okay, so I'll answer that one. Um, so we we went through a whole day once we gave them an initial draft, sat with their contract manager, went over every single one of our findings, every single one of our documents, including their documents, which we, by the way, have in custody, full custody of. Okay. So um, after that, we were not nobody challenged us in that we have those documents or they're somewhere else. So if those documents now exist, I'm not questioning that they do or don't, but what I do question is why weren't they provided to, to us at that time when they had that option because it was still in draft form. And secondly, even if they were provided to us, if, if they did go that far, my question would be, we audited the custody of the folder that they said was their, their, their system of record. So those documents upon payment should have existed upon that payment before they paid it, which they didn't. So if those documents were sitting on somebody's desk or if they were in another form or somewhere else, that doesn't justify making that payment then because at the time of payment, they did not have that document that was required. Moving forward, it's obvious, as Ray said, that there is a lot that needs to be fixed and it is around, focused around just really broken systems, systems that are kind of homemade and systems that do not interface with each other. They don't talk to each other. That creates a huge problem in any organization, especially one that deals with the size and the number of contracts that Sandag does. With that being said, our intention is to follow up on those um, unsupported invoices because that's the, the concerning part is, no, we did not find any wrongdoing or fraud on Sandag side. It's just poor controls is what it boils down to. We didn't see any intention there. However, we weren't, audit, we weren't able to audit on the contractor side if there was any abuse from their, their end. 
And so it's our intention that moving forward for our next year, we have a continuous auditing plan that we're gonna be bringing to you in July and putting in place, which consists of going back to those top 10 that we identified as very high risk and 700% amendments and such and looking at those 92% of missing documents that we identified and specifically auditing and focusing on those contractors and the invoice and documentation to actually determine were they fully supported, going back to the contractor and asking for evidence that should have been submitted with payment and if they can prove to us that every dime they were paid was supported and under contract. And if it wasn't, then that will be a report that will come back to the board identifying that contractors were paid when they shouldn't have been paid and why. Good, thank you. All right, third and last question. Finding number two, vendor seven um, was originally awarded a contract of 25 million. And over time that turned into 128 million, which was 48% of the total 260 million available for these types of contracts. And I'd like to gain some understanding of how, in what steps, in what increments, a $25 million contract turned into a $128 million contract. So I'm gonna hand it over to Crystal after I say this, is that it, it's obvious in part one, if you go to part one and you see the percentage changes in some of the top amendments that were anywhere from 100% to up to 700%, frankly, which is quite high. We did uh, a baseline for SANDAG and determined that the overall of all contracts for SANDAG's baseline is 19% amendment change. So there's a, a typically a 19% that's normal and it's actually normal amongst most government agencies. However, you've seen the areas of which we've seen are deemed as high risk and concerning that they had 100% or an, and up to 700% in some cases. I think a lot of that is poor planning, um, too generalized in scope. So a lack of really scoping out your project, which is goes back to poor planning and and getting comfortable with that process and always being in a rush to, to get stuff done, which Sandag is, you know, they're busy. Um, and also that they don't encumber. So when you don't encumber by fiscal year at least, say you have a five year contract, well we're under we understand that you can't encumber for the whole five years in that one year, but you can encumber and you should be encumbering right when you initiate a contract for that fiscal year for the full amount of that contract. That is not done. And I think that leads to the opportunity for spillage. So going over the budget, going over it quickly, and then the work not being done and needing to get that amendment done and push through, which creates an amendment after an amendment after amendment. So I think the hugest problem is more a lack of planning, poor scoping, and just not encumbering your funds, which has led to these huge amounts of, of um, amendments. And then Crystal, do you have anything you wanna add around that? I mean, just to reiterate, it was through the issuance of task orders and amendments. It was, the 25 was the initial award amount and as work was identified and increased and changed or whatever, um, it, they, it, it increased to 128. Right, and each of those individual increases were actually within the policies. It's it, technically allowed because it's an on-call contract. So the on-call contract basically means that you have this huge bucket of money, um, the 260 million, and if only task orders are awarded to one vendor, then that one vendor can get all 260 million. And that was really the issue there is that you do have it on-call. So you have a, a five people that sit on the bench. Well, that, one that the example that we had was supposed to be amongst that total amount amongst all those on call should have had the opportunity to to have a competitive bid within those on the bench and we found that that wasn't the case that this one wow. particular vendor happened to be getting all of these in addition so they got 48 percent of the total amount that was really supposed to be shared amongst all on call that were on the bench yeah so I'll oh, if go we can, add to add a little bit. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm trying. Okay. Yeah, just I'll, to, I'll just bring you back to your attention to that finding. If you see the other items listed there, those are basically reasons like that attribute to the increase. So the seven contract amendments, 38 task order amendments and so on. So that's all part of that. 
Good. Right. And my closing comment is, you know, as Ray was speaking about this and we were listening, you know, what occurred to me is, you know, effectively what's happening is Sandeg has grown really big, really fast. And it reminded me somewhat of my stepson when he was 15 years old and did things that he should never have done. You know, we corrected him and now he's a nice mature 27 year old. <laughs> Let's go on to uh, Councilman Duncan. Thank you. I, this, I have to make this comment. You know, I, I think that in the future with the independent auditors reports that those are the outside auditor, we, those should be on the agenda earlier with a sufficient amount of time to have proper board discussion. It's too important. I have too much respect for the work you've done and the way you've approached your job with seriousness and diligence and um, for it to be put at the end of our agenda when we're here without our chair without our vice chair, without many of our members, to me comes across as, as disrespectful and minimizing of, of the job that they do. And it's it, 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 even if that's not accurate, but that's an intent, and I'm not asserting it, it's an, the intent, but the effect of, of is, is multiplied out there potentially to the public when they look at this and see how we're handling this review of this report. And furthermore, I'm concerned because we're going to be looking for a new independent auditor is my understanding in the very near future or already are. And if I'm that independent auditor and I'm looking at whether I wanna take this job, I look at what type of support the board is going to have um, and the staff, frankly, uh, with um, my new job and, and whether the work that I'm gonna to have to do, which is not easy work, is going to be taken appropriately, seriously um, by the board. And if it appears that it's not, why would I want that job? And you know, I, again, I'm not trying to be too harsh not a political position. Really, going forward, we should probably have a separate board meeting just on the independent auditor's report. It's too important to not do that. And I think the law tells us it's important that we do our job and do that. So um, I have a hard two o'clock meeting that I cannot push. And I wish we could have a full board discussion on on these, these important issues. Thank you for your hard work. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Let's go to Imperial Beach, Council Member Fisher. Thank you. You know, you know, the old adage is you only know what you know. And I think this is a good springboard because now we, we've seen the uncoverings of the past. And so, you know, it, it, what, what this needs to do is create a higher level of accountability, not only for SANDAC staff, but us as the board. We now have a responsibility to make sure that uh, things are going forward and in, in the accountability has had. It's had. The one thing that you know is very apparent that because of the strength of OIPA, it's created some strength for the agency. Um, and I think that's what's important as we go forward and we're looking for a new director um, that, they, that they have that backbone, they have strength. Nothing's harder than to go to someone that appears to be your boss and tell them they're doing stuff wrong and to hold firm. Um, you know, in all the management responses, management felt they were doing the right thing. And perhaps they did think they were doing the right thing, but it's obvious that there is a lot of correction that needs to be made. So uh, as a board, I think our commitment is really to make sure that the momentum that uh, has been been made, that it continues. Uh, Mary, I thank you for all you've done and for your ability to continue uh, with us for a few extra months instead of going straight to retirement. I can't imagine after going through this process, uh, retirement must look pretty good right now. Uh, and so, you know, and again, I hope that perhaps in, in our search, uh, there might be a, a member of your team that would be interested uh, in that position mm -hmm. and qualified yeah. and capable. So thanks thank for all you've you. done. Thank you, Councilman Fisher. Any other comments from uh, Encinitas? Um, yes, sir. Um, I've considered this report to be quite devastating. I know that we got good people here and, um, you know, I reflect on the fact that uh, AB 805 was passed in order to try and allow this agency to regain some credibility. And I think this report uh, takes us a step further back. So um, it's some of these findings are pretty shocking. And I understand what Mr. Major had to say in terms of the efforts that are being put forth to rectify and address some of the findings, but I think the pace is way too slow. I think that the question about these policies that allowed the 
procurement process to just go awry. We need to have on an agenda very soon. I don't know whether we need subcommittees to be looking at these policies. Um, it's taking too long. And so um, I'm looking for the chair, vice chair, second, oh, they're not here. Um, but I hope we can convey to them how important it is that we address this with emergency meetings if we need to, you know, not, you know, special meetings, whatever. Um, one of the biggest concerns that I had in this report is uh, the issue of the auditor having difficulty conducting her audit because matters that were due to data, records, and information restricted or not made available to the auditors by SANDAG staff. What would that be? Ray mentioned, um, Mayor, not that we wanted to not give OIP uh, access to anything, but there were some instances where giving full access will violate some of the privacy for our employees. Okay, yes. so, no. so excuse me, and uh, we're, we're short on time. Can we see that in closed session? Sure. Well, Ray, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, actually, I want to elaborate on it. So, okay. so AB 805 clearly says we are to have unlimited, unrestricted access, including to employee information. Now, I understand that Andre was trying to do his best, and, and he, he truly did feel that he was protecting the confidentiality of employees. However, what he needs to understand, and he should understand as a previous auditor, is that there should be no limit to audit access. We as auditors have the highest level of ethical and requirements around professional standards around confidentiality. I have audited HIPAA. I have audited many things as an auditor far beyond a social security number or bank information. Right. And so that was a, an excuse that is really unacceptable. And, and I'm, like I said, I understand that their intent was not, you know, in the wrong way. However, they clearly need to understand when you are asking, when an auditor is asking access to a system, they should be giving full unlimited access, especially when it's confirmed in law in AB 805 that it's confirmed to do so. And that wasn't, and I know that they now understand that and moving forward, we shouldn't have any problem, but it did restrict our ability to do analytics and it did restrict our ability to, to perform our job, even though we did try to work with them and get information. It was on a PDF, it wasn't useful information. So is there no use in having that information to uh, have a better audit at well, this point? They, so what the information we were trying to get wasn't related, but giving us that access would have opened our eyes to that ability to look at that stuff. What they needed to understand is we don't look at things we don't need to look at, but we do and are entitled to that access. And, and knowing that um, as an auditor and Andrea uh, as a previous auditor should know that we are held to a very high level of confidentiality, far beyond anyone, by the way, in this agency. And so we just should have not been limited on our access for anything. And it clearly states that in AB 805. And so who made the decision to withhold that information? I did. You did, uh, okay. Based, I did make the decision based on the fact that we felt very strongly, and I don't question the integrity of the audit staff, we felt very strongly that disclosing some personal information like social security, names, other information, will be in violation of the personal rules here. I felt that very strongly. Now, the, as Ray said, the new systems that we're, we're doing would allow the auditors to get the information without access to that information. But I am the one who did uh, okay. say that. Uh, we wanted, I uh, guess Mary would agree, that we, the, the CFO office, made available to the audit staff to come and sit in place and get the information, but not the full access they were asking for. So, when we, so some of what I see in these findings is, you know, it just makes me wonder, how could checks be cut with so few controls over, you know, it just, uh, it's just mind boggling, uh, an agency with this much, I mean. I don't think that's the issue with the, with the access. Mm -hmm. The issue was restricting full access where some information are very private. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to a separate uh, issue, which is okay. just the, the notion of, con, you know, transmitting the revenue to these vendors without all of the documents. I, I don't know how somebody does that. And, you know, maybe they're here, maybe they're gone, I don't know. But uh, my hope is that uh, if we were to start 
uh, you know, another audit that we wouldn't find the same problems. And, you know, the procurement process, I think I saw on the timeline, it's going until 2025 and, you know, they're, they're the systems installations. And uh, to me, it's just not acceptable. And I don't know how we're gonna address that, but I look forward to- Yeah, it's not, I, I really items. do appreciate the comments about the board. I've, I think you should have all the time you need with all of you here discussing these issues. But also let me remind, and I think Mary and her team would agree, we're operating under existing policies. Uh, like for example, one of the findings is about me, uh, my authority to sign on behalf of the board. Uh, last, I think a couple of years ago, the board uh, added, I think a couple of hundred thousand dollars to my authorities. Is that the right policy, the wrong policy? That's for you to decide. But operating under policies, the board need to discuss these policies and, and make a new policies if they think these policies are too, too lax. Or I think most of the findings deals with the fact that nobody did anything intentional. There are existing policies that allows you to do these things. And it's for you to decide whether these are the right policies or not. Uh, so so I, in a way, we're operating under policies in 2002, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016. And now it's time for you to have enough time to discuss and put new policies in place. I look forward to the conversation about the policies. Any policies that would let this many sole source contracts be let is definitely sure. not what this agency needs. Sure. Thank you, Mayor Kranz. And uh, uh, Councilmember Duncan, I will convey your thoughts as well as uh, Mayor Kranz's thoughts uh, to the uh, chair and vice chair who are not here today. Um, Mary, I have a, unless there are any other questions from any board members, I'll have, I have a few questions for Mary. Can I just add one remark? Go ahead. Um, I, I fully agree with what I've heard from my my board mem my fellow board members. Um, it's not just them who are saying this. We all are. You know, there are twelve of us here right now. That's twelve of nineteen. County is represented, and I really do think that it's pitiful that we're doing this with the city of San Diego missing, Solana Beach missing, Chula Vista missing, our chair is missing, and. Lemon Grove is missing. You know, the, everybody should really be here at the table, listening to what's being said. Thank you, Mary Gasolin. Uh, with that, I have a few questions for for um, the auditors for Mary, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe Crystal can ask. With your example of um, the contract that was um, uh, amended and went from twenty some thousand up to one hundred twenty some thousand, were any policies broken at that time? I'm going to ask, I need just quick, quick answer. Was a policy of Sandag broken at that time when those were amended? I'm yep. looking through the, let, let me see. Oh, so oh, the non-competitive non bidding, um, that's not standard practice. So does- No, I'm asking where any, uh, I just need a yes or no answer. I'll answer this. Yes, because they did not openly compete when they were supposed to. One, that finding wasn't even about that, though. More, it was more about showing that there is a clear indication of concern, whether it be poor planning or scoping, where the one individual, rather than the entire on-call bench, had the opportunity to take 48% of what should have went to a, an on-call bench of a group of people. So I got that. Uh, thank you for that answer. And one other question. Uh, you mentioned that you have full access to information uh, as auditor. Does that include personnel information of yes, individuals? It does. And so it clearly states actions? that it clearly states that in AB eight hundred five. In fact, right after it says unlimited, unrestricted access, mm -hmm. it states employee and information. So yes, no other state personnel law uh, and, and privacy laws. Are you given access to disciplinary action? Maybe council can answer that question. You can, yeah, council can answer it, but yes, I'm very comfortable with stating it does include all that. And I've audited for 30 years at government and can tell you I've had full access to all of that. You wanna go ahead and answer that? I'm happy Perfect. to comment it. I agree with Mary that under AB 805, the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor has unrestricted access to all information required to conduct an audit or otherwise perform audit duties. The question is, what is required to perform an audit? Here, management tried to meet a, a dual requirement to cooperate with the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor, giving them everything they need, while also maintaining the requirement 
to Sandag employees to maintain the confidentiality of information. And I believe that they did that. We certainly are always open to finding new and better ways to coordinate those efforts and provide every bit of access that we can. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll just make one last comment. Um, in, earlier in today's meeting, uh, board members uh, kind of um, didn't like the state coming down on Sandag with all kinds of requirements. I can assure you that the former Sandag board would not have created the Office of Independent uh, uh, Auditor, uh, but thank you, State of California, AB805, at least this portion of AB805 for all of us. We do have an independent uh, auditor to reveal this information. So sometimes the state does something that we like. Uh, and Anderson, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up. I used the button instead of my hand. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, the only question I had, and uh, I'm not sure who to address this to, uh, a lot of this stuff happened before I was on this board, and I understand mistakes were made, but are we going to present how we've adapted or what the timetable is? Because it's pretty astounding. I was just remarking to my colleague here that if we had done this in our campaigns, the FPPC would have us in jail. So I am I'm concerned about moving forward uh, and learning from this lesson. What is the timetable in how this would comply and, and move forward? And when do we get to see that presentation? So um, as Ray shared, that they're working on a corrective action plan. It's, it's a work in progress because there are, I think, a total of 98 recommendations between part one and part two, and a lot of it lies with a new system. Um, but, you know, Ray is working with that. What we do as o part of OPA's responsibility is to ensure that they're following up and they're actually doing their corrective action plans. So on a quarterly basis, we reach out to management and say, and we have an actual report that will also come to you, and it has been to you before, of all open corrective action plans on SANDAG, not just our corrective actions, but also outside auditors. And we follow up on those and um, ask them for evidence that they've completed it. We look at it to see if it's sufficient. We even test around it if necessary. And then we come on a quarterly basis and report, here's what management's done. And then I have a discussion with the board stating, yes, they have done it and it is working. So we do have a really good follow-up to make sure that these corrective action plans are happening and that they are being addressed. And I, and I apologize, my presentation was cut short, so I wasn't able to go through all of how we were planning on doing the implementation. But I think the, the magnitude of the undertaking that we're doing right now is not just looking at contracts. We are essentially tearing out the, the entire underpinnings of all the software systems here at Sandag. There's 15 different software systems that do everything from HR to contracts, to finance, to payroll, to you name it. They're all coming out because they're all either homegrown or they're all running uh, software that has been discontinued or they're Excel based and we're, we're combining it into a standard industry ERP system that over a thousand different government agencies use that are all tied together so that finance and contracts are tied together rather than being two different systems and then having two different numbers come out of those. This is the implementation plan for those systems. And as you can see, the, the finance module is, is the first one that's going in. This is a tremendous amount of work. We have contractors from the outside. We have, um, we have, we have other people we brought in too who kind of are management representatives to help us implement this. And we have teams that are on this doing this at the same time they're trying to do the rest of their work. But finance is going first. And right now we're in, in the testing phases of the finance modules. The contracts modules are not done yet. Right now we're in the process of designing those. We have, when we first wrote this down, we had over 980 workflows in our contracts system. There's no way that we can bring those forward. We had to simplify those, and now we're down to below 50 uh, workflows. So we redefine what we're doing in contracts, then we write the new SOPs and procedures on top of that. And as you can see in this timeline, through 2023, so all through the summer and into the fall, we are working uh, on implementing all of these different systems. Those yellow arrows show you which Audit findings will be taken care of during those time periods. So the SOPs, training manuals, and training of the staff uh, from, from part one and part two of the audit, all those different findings are taking place on, on that dark green line. Right now, our, our estimate is it will be done at the end of the year with those for contracts. Then we move to HR and we do the same thing there. 
Thank you. Very good. That's Supervisor Thank Anderson, you. just Supervisor Anderson. I think two board meetings ago, I mean, Mary and her team did several audits so far in three years. And I think uh, I'll let her speak to that, but I think we be pretty good in checking, making sure that we're complying with these audit findings and represented to the board of directors. We do send a quarterly report to you about some of the of the audit and, and she will do the same at one point. We'll come to the board. She will come to the board and, and, and say we did what we did, but we're not planning to just forget about this once this report is over. Like the schedule said, it will be done this year with all that we needed to do. I said also, told this board, this is a growing pain. We're fixing policies that are very old and we're fixing system that actually very obsolete and that costs money and, and we're willing to pull that money. Uh, but I, I promise you that we're getting better. We're more accountable. I wanna thank Mary and her team for that. But I also trust Trey. Uh, he, he was appointed the deputy CEO for operation for a reason that he's taking all these system and this seriously. Cause I do believe regardless of who's gonna be here next, that uh, the, whoever comes next deserve to have uh, policies that are updated, accountability, and for you, because you you have the responsibility at the end of the day to feel comfortable about what we're doing. If, 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 if I just may, uh, I, if I came across as accusatory, that wasn't my goal, but having hard deadlines is always very helpful. All of us are public figures, we're accountable, and people are gonna to complain to us on the street. So having that information arms us to defend the good work we're doing moving forward. So thank you for that. There was a slide in the presentation about the ERP procurement and it started in 2018 or something. That, so in order to purchase, first we defined what we needed. We started this conversation in 2018 and then we had to, we had to understand what was that system that we needed? There was over 2,400 requirements that we had to put together uh, in order to, to even map what HR and finance and, and contracts needed so that we could put an RFP together. We went out to, to bid, we went out to, and, and we got several different vendors. We had vendor presentations. We selected the vendor, and as soon as we selected, as of April, we started doing the implementation. So it, it's just a, a lengthy process. I just, yes, I would, <laughs> The um, bad name that government has is well earned because of things like this. In the private sector, this never works, right? And I'm not saying yes. that government should run like a business, but government's got to do better than that, especially with the results of this audit and the millions of dollars, perhaps billions, that we can't very effectively account for. And I appreciate that statement and, and government is difficult to work with because of the way that our procurement process is. But it, it's also important to note that this, this audit was started 18 months ago. As management, we were aware that these systems are broken. We, not, we didn't need to do an audit to know that they needed to be fixed. And what Mary do, did was to point out with her team where it was broken, which is incredibly helpful when implementing to make sure we have the appropriate controls in here. But as I also wanted to point, I reiterate, they're working with us on not only the requirements for the new ERP, but testing the ERP to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. So, you know, we're, we're doing as much as we can to do this as quickly as possible, but we also have to administer 3,000 open contracts right now that are an ongoing concern. And, to, and just to understand the magnitude of what's going on, those, those contracts, are, there's half are in finance, or there's 3,000 financial pieces, there's 3,000 contracts pieces. We now have to take those from those systems and create one record, which is the new version of the truth, this new one joint record, and somehow get that into the new system. So doing one wouldn't be a big deal, but we now have to do that 3,000 times if we're going to manage all 3,000 of our contracts in the new system, because these contracts sometimes are open for 10 years, like the ones for the Midcoast. And so it's a huge undertaking on our part to do it. And I, I guarantee you we are working on this as, as hard as we can, and it is just a lengthy and super involved process. I'm going to go to uh, Councilmember Burke Coder and then Councilmember Zito. And I just want to remind uh, the board, there's no action take being taken today. This is a uh, discussion item. I'm, I'm very likely to continue for, for, for a while. So thank please. you. 
This reminds me of the Johnny Cash song about the, the guy that works at the car factory and has like a 57, 60, 61, 62 Chevy. Like you, you had all these systems to create this thing that weren't talking to each other. So congratulations, Ray. You have finally made Apple talk to Google. We're trying to do that. Thank you. <laughs> this is exactly what you're trying to do. In all seriousness, I think um, at first glance, when you look at these things, we do get kind of sticker shocked by what the findings are. And it can be for responsible, fiscally conservative person like myself. It is my eyes like pop out of my head and my head spins around and smoke comes out of my ears. But taking it back and realizing, yes, the audit started 18 months ago. Thank you for Mary, for you and your team for doing such a thorough job and exposing where we can need to do stitches or put a Band-Aid on something. And now we know. And so now begins the accountability part on this side of the room. So that's what I think we need to focus on, not the things that were exposed necessarily, but how to cure it and fix it and move forward uh, and, and more responsibly, more like the grown adults that we are in the room and the way we would treat our own checkbook at home, although with technology, nobody balances a checkbook anymore. Um, but anyway, so thank you for that. Um, didn't want to prolong the statement, but I just kept thinking of Johnny Cash while you were talking. So there you go. Councilman Zito. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks, Councilmember Gastelin, for making me realize that Solana Beach can now be back at the table. Um, but I did. I did want to loop back around to my opening comments when this item kicked off, which is, you know, to be perfectly honest, if if uh, I had my druthers and the way I would naturally be inclined to think, inclined to work, I would prefer to bring something to the board that's more fully baked. I mean, we were talking about a lot of things that aren't complete here with respect to we don't see the full plan, we don't see this, but, you know, it's a judgment call and relative to some of the comments that have been raised in this discussion, about the slowness of government versus trying to move fast. You know, a decision was made, particularly also by the audit committee, that it's important to keep this moving along. Probably the best way to keep this moving along is to make sure the board is is brought looped in with where we're at and where we're going. And that's why, um, thank you for your last comments there. You know, the key point is here, do we think this is a good a good step and a good kick and, and a direction that we're going? And that's one of the key things that I was hoping to get, looking for out of this. Um, relative to moving forward, I would just encourage all, all of us to realize that um, relative to Mayor Kranz's comments, um, we do have a subcommittee to work on this. It's called the Audit Committee. I would encourage you all to continue pushing things through the Audit Committee, and we'll be happy to make recommendations. That body has one advantage that, that not only does it have three board members on it, albeit they're alternates, it has three very experienced members of the public on it as well that can provide input to any recommendations that are being made. So we're there and ready and uh, we'll be willing to work through anything that comes up um, with respect to these recommendations. And, and as been pointed out, we'll be getting regular updates from management and the OIPA on how this is going forward and bringing those to the board as we feel put, as we feel right, um, knowing that there's this fine balance. This is important. We need to move quick, but we also want to make sure we do it right too. Thanks. And, and I was referring to policy questions for subcommittee. I understood. I would recommend those go through the audit committee for recommendations if those are policies that make sense to change given the audit findings. Thanks. So with that, thank you, the audit committee, for, for working on this, as well as uh, Ray, uh, Office of Independent Counsel. You had a final comment, Ray? I, or? Uh, yeah, I do. Sorry, I think that there's an action with this particular item. No? It's to accept the to accept the audit. Okay, so, so we need I make a motion to accept the audit? So pick somebody. It's a possible action. We can accept the, the, the report itself, uh, and it's been made by uh, Councilmember Morlina. Is there a second? Yes. Uh, so let's, let's, I heard Anderson, so I'll, I'll take him as a second. So it's been moved by Molina, second by Anderson, accept the report. Uh, I don't know which one I can, I'm supposed to push here. I'll push that's this, not, this one anyway. I'll, I'll vote. I'll, I'll, I just voted for the county, I think, but that's right. Uh, uh, or you want to push La Mesa for me? Just push La Mesa for me. And that's not Chicago. Don't vote for anybody. Well, I pushed for you. You already voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think everyone here has voted. Santee. Are there, and the, 11. That we don't need any, we have, those members are ready. 
So um, yeah, thank you, right. we're finished. Yeah. That concludes the, our meeting and our next uh, board meeting is June 9th at 10 o'clock and we are adjourned. Tonight at 10 o'clock, go get dinner, come back. <laughs> okay. Hey Jack.